Sometimes mathematical situations arise where we aren't worried about whether certain quantities are actually equal to one another. Instead, we just want to know that one quantity is maybe less than or greater than the other. For example, if we have an expression for the cost for our business and another expression for revenue or income for our business, we'd like to know the circumstances under which the cost expression will be less than the revenue expression. In other words, we'd like to make a profit. So we'd like to see mathematical situations where we're not worried about things being equal, just whether one thing is larger than or smaller than another. And this leads us to the topic of solving linear inequalities. A linear inequality provides an algebraic way to identify a part of the xy plane, or the Cartesian coordinate plane, whose boundary is a straight line. For example, if we wanted to discuss the part of the xy plane where the points satisfy y greater than zero, then we'd be talking about all of the points in quadrants one and two. We'd also be talking about the boundary line uh, because y equals zero or the x-axis are the same thing. But if you're only looking at y greater than zero, strictly greater than zero, then you only care about quadrants one and two. Before we jump into these linear inequalities, which cut the plane into two regions, I'd like to talk uh, for a moment about some basic properties of inequalities. And I'd like to discuss inequalities on just the number line, the number line by itself, not the Cartesian plane, but just the one-dimensional number line. It's really important to remember some basic facts about inequalities. So let's start with the following. First, let's let A, B, and C just be three variables that represent some numbers, real numbers. And then we know the following. If A is less than B, then A plus C is less than B plus C. In other words, if you have one number that's already less than another and you add the same amount to both sides or the same amount to both numbers, then the inequality stays the same. Why is that actually true? Well, you can think about it on the number line. If A is less than B, that means that A would be to the left of B on that number line. If you then add the same quantity, say C, to A, you'll shift A by C units to the right. But by doing that, when you add C to B, you would shift B by the same amount. So on the number line, if A is here and B is to its right, adding C to both of them simply shifts them together. So if A was to the left of B before, then A plus C would still be to the left of B plus C. And that means that if A is less than B, then A plus C would be less than B plus C. So adding the same amount to an inequality doesn't change the sign. So for example, we know that five is less than eight. That's pretty common knowledge. That means that if you added four to both sides of five is less than eight, you'd get five plus four, which is nine, is less than eight plus four, which is 12. That's just a small numerical example of the rule I was telling you a few moments ago. By the way, that same property is also true if A is less than or equal to B, not just strictly less than. In other words, if A is less than or equal to B and you add C to both sides of that inequality, you'll have the statement A plus C is less than or equal to B plus C. That would be another rule that you could state. A similar statement can be true when the inequality symbol is a greater than symbol and also when it's greater than or equal to. In other words, here's the point. If you have an inequality written down and you add the same amount to both sides of that inequality, then the inequality sign doesn't change. That's the important property we need to keep in mind. Similarly, if you have an inequality written down, whether it's with a less than symbol or a less than or equal to symbol or a greater than symbol or a greater than or equal to symbol and you subtract the same amount from both sides, then the inequality stays the same. The reasoning there is 
the same kind of reasoning as we had before. If A is less than B on the number line, and you subtract C from both sides, then the numbers just get shifted, but they get shifted together. And that means if A was less than B to begin with, and you subtract C from both of them, then A minus C will still be less than B minus C. So subtracting from both sides of an inequality keeps the inequality symbol the same, whether you start with a less than, or a less than or equal to, or a greater than, or a greater than or equal to. So for example, you know five is less than eight. We also know then that three is less than six because five minus two is less than eight minus two. Ah, so addition and subtraction don't really do much to inequalities. They don't change the inequality symbol. But what about multiplication and division? Well, it's a very, very different story. Consider, for example, that 5 is less than 8. You already knew that. What if I multiply both sides of the inequality, 5 is less than 8, by the same number, let's say 2? Then I'll have 5 times 2 is less than 8 times 2, or 10 is less than 16. Is 10 less than 16? Yes, it is. So that's a good thing. The 2, but multiplication by 2, didn't change the inequality. Now, what if I take 5 is less than 8, and I multiply both sides of that by negative 3. Then I'm going to have the statement negative 15 is less than negative 24. That's actually not correct. In fact, negative 15 is bigger than negative 24. And you might be saying, how in the world could that be? Well, here's how. Take your number line again, put the 0 somewhere in the middle, and now ask yourself, where is negative 15 and where is negative 24? Negative 15 is 15 units to the left of your zero, so it's here. And negative 24 would be negative 24 units to the left of zero, so it would be even farther out. Now, which number's to the right and which number's to the left? Well, negative 15 would have been here and negative 24 would have been farther over to the left. And that means that the negative 24 is actually less than negative 15, or negative 15 is greater than negative 24. So notice what would have happened then. We started with 5 is less than 8, and when we multiplied by negative 3, we got negative 15 is greater than negative 24. And that little example leads us to a very big and very important math fact. And here's what it is. If you start with a is less than b, and c is a positive number, and you multiply both sides of the inequality by c, then the inequality doesn't change. You're left with ac is less than bc. But if a is less than b and c is a negative number, and you multiply both sides by that c, then the inequality sign must change. So if a had started out less than b, then ac needs to be greater than bc. And this property is true whether you're using a less than symbol or a greater than symbol, a less than or equal to, or a greater than or equal to. All of those are going to have the same property. Multiplication by a negative number switches the inequality. A similar statement can be made when you divide by numbers as well with inequalities. Here's what that statement is. If you have an inequality and you divide by a positive number, then the inequality doesn't change. So if you start with a is less than b and you divide by a positive number c, then a divided by c will still be less than b divided by c. But if you start with a is less than b and c is a negative number and you divide by that c, then a over c becomes bigger than b over c. So when it comes to multiplying or dividing an inequality, you must know what the sign of the numbers are because if you multiply or divide by a negative number, the inequality is going to switch. That doesn't matter when you're adding and subtracting. When you add and subtract to an inequality, the inequality symbol just sits there. But when you multiply or divide, you must know whether you are multiplying or dividing by a positive number or a negative number. Okay, that's a quick review of some of the arithmetic facts 
that have inequalities in them. And they're very, very important. And we're going to use them as we walk through the rest of this lesson together. With those done, I'd like to turn our attention now to graphing inequalities just on the number line. We're going to do an example or two of that very quickly. So for example, let's say we wanted to graph the inequality x is less than or equal to 3 just on the number line. What do we do? You've probably done some of these in the past, but let's just make sure we're on the same page together. If you want to graph x is less than or equal to 3 just on the number line, you draw your horizontal line or number line, you label some of the points, you better label 3 because it's an important one, maybe you label 0 as well. You draw a dot at 3 and you fill in that dot and then you somehow shade the portion of the number line to the left of 3. Why to the left of 3? Because you're trying to show all the points that are less than or equal to 3. Once you've done that, several things ought to be noticed. First of all, by doing this problem, you have split or separated the number line into two different pieces. You've grabbed the parts that are less than or equal to 3, and you've also distinguished the parts that are greater than 3. You've got the piece you shaded and the piece you didn't. Okay? That's one comment to make. The second comment to make is, if the inequality had been x is strictly less than 3 instead of x is less than or equal to 3, you would have used an open circle to mark the point at 3. You would not have shaded it in because 3 is not included in the set of numbers which satisfy x is less than 3. 3 is not less than 3. So these two comments are going to come into play when we start talking about linear inequalities in the plane in just a second. Well, with all of this as background, I do want to go now to some linear inequalities in the Cartesian plane or the xy plane. So the idea is going to be, we're going to be handed an inequality which is going to have a line as its boundary in the xy plane and we're going to want to know which part of the Cartesian plane do we shade in. Just like a moment ago we took our number line in one dimension and we shaded in one part of it and left the other part alone. So let's look at the following example. I want us to graph the solution set of the linear inequality y is less than 2x plus 1. Now, before we go anywhere, let's make sure we understand exactly what I just told you to do. Graph the solution set of the linear inequality y is less than 2x plus 1. There are lots of solutions to y is less than 2x plus 1. In fact, there are infinitely many different pairs for x and y that you could plug in so that the y was less than 2x plus 1. So I'm looking for all of those pairs inside the Cartesian plane. To start the problem, I'm going to first sketch the graph of y equals 2x plus 1, not y is less than 2x plus 1. What can I do with that line? Well, that line, of course, it's just a straight line because y equals 2x plus 1 is written in slope-intercept form. That line serves as a boundary, a very natural boundary, for the region of the xy plane which does represent the set of solutions for the inequality. So when I draw that line, I'm going to do it in a dashed fashion, not as a connected line, if you will, but in a dashed form. Why am I going to do it dashed? Well, because the points on the line, y equals 2x plus 1, are not part of the solution set for y is strictly less than 2x plus 1. And now here's the analogy with the open circle on the number line from a few moments ago. Remember, on the number line, when you're just dealing with one-dimensional problems on that number line, you use an open circle to show that that number is not part of the solution set. When my line in two dimensions is not part of the solution set, I'm going to draw it in a dashed fashion so that I remind myself that the points on the line are not part of the solution. And they're not going to be part of the solution exactly when the original problem started out with a strictly less than or a strictly greater than. And now the question is, and this is the whole question for the rest of the example, which two regions of the xy plane do I want to shade in? In other words, the solutions of y is less than 2x plus 1 
are all going to be either on one side of the line we just drew or they're going to be on the other side. So I want to pick which of those two. It's a 50-50 problem, okay? You just have to pick which of the two to shade in. In this case, we want y is less than 2x plus 1. And because of that, I'm going to choose to shade in the part of the plane which is below the line. And I'm choosing that because I want the y's to be less than as opposed to greater than. And so I shade in that whole region of the xy plane. All of the points in that region are solutions of the inequality. Now, before we go on though, you know me, I always want us to check our answers. So we should do that here. Well, here's how you would check your answer very, very quickly just to see if it's plausible. Every point in the region you've shaded is supposed to satisfy the inequality. Pick a point in that region and just see if it actually works. Notice that the origin is in the region you've shaded. That's the point 0, 0. That means that 0, 0 must be in the solution set of the inequality. So let's plug in 0 for x and 0 for y in the original inequality and see if we get a true statement. y is less than 2x plus 1 is going to become 0 is less than 2 times 0 plus 1 when we plug in 0 comma 0. The left hand side of course is 0, then I have less than 0 plus 1 because 2 times 0 is 0. And 0 plus 1 is 1. So I have the statement 0 is less than 1. Now that's not an equality statement, but it is a mathematical statement. 0 is less than 1. Is that a true statement? Yes, it is. And because that's a true statement, I'm confident that 0, 0 is part of my answer set. And because 0, 0 is in the region that we shaded, I say we did it right, and I say we move forward. So let's move forward to another example. Let's graph the solution set of the linear inequality 4x plus 8y is greater than or equal to 10. So to start this problem, I need to figure out the boundary edge which is the straight line defined by 4x plus 8y equals 10. This is the standard form of the equation of this line. And once I can figure out where that line is, I can plot it. And then I know that all of my solutions live on either one side or the other side of that line. So let's take 4x plus 8y equals 10 and rewrite it in slope intercept form just so we can plot it quickly. 4x plus 8y equals 10. Subtract the 4x to the right-hand side, and you'll have 8y equals negative 4x plus 10. Now, you can divide both sides by 8, and you'll have y, because the 8's cancel, equals negative 4x over 8 plus 10 over 8. Or you'll have y equals negative 1 half x, because 4 over 8 is 1 half, plus 5 over 4, because 10 over 8 reduces to 5 over 4, or 5 fourths. And now I know what my boundary line is for the solution set here. It has a slope of negative 1 half, and it has a y-intercept of 5 fourths. Notice also that the original problem had a greater than or equal to symbol, rather than just a strict greater than symbol. And because of that, I'm going to draw in my line in a solid way, not in the dashed way, but solidly. And so let's draw that line in now. You need to do that on some graph paper if you have it. And once you've drawn in that line, you have now defined two very natural regions of the xy plane. One of them is sort of above that line, the other one is below. The question is, which set of points, the ones above the line or the ones below the line, are going to satisfy the original inequality? Well. I want the ones where y is greater than or equal to minus 1 half x plus 5 fourths. So I'm going to choose the region that is above because I want the y's to be greater than or equal to this line. And therefore, the y's need to get big. So I'm done. Well, again, I should really check my answers. So we should pick a point that's in the region that you've shaded and let's see if it actually makes the inequality true. Notice that the origin now is not in my solution set. I've shaded away from the origin, so I need to pick another point. 
well, why not a point on the y-axis, which is above the y-intercept of the boundary line? Something like, how about 0, 3? 0, 3 is in the set. Is it really going to make the original inequality true? Let's check. The original inequality was 4x plus 8y is greater than or equal to 10. x equals 0, y equals 3 gives me 4 times 0 plus 8 times 3 is greater than or equal to 10. That says 0 plus 24 is greater than or equal to 10, or 24 is greater than or equal to 10. Now, is 24 greater than or equal to 10? If one of us had $24 and the other of us had $10, I think the one with 24 would have more money. So indeed, 24 is greater than or equal to 10. It's a true statement, and therefore the point we chose really is in the solution set. Now, there was nothing special about 0, 3. We could have actually picked any point that was in the shaded area. But in our case, it was very helpful to pick it because one of the values inside the ordered pair was 0. And that 0 kind of simplified our arithmetic. And that's why I chose that one. Now, I want to move to another example that might be a bit confusing at first. My goal in showing it to you is to try to get over that confusion so that if you see such a problem again later on, like in the guidebook, you won't be bothered by it. So here's the example. Graph the solution set in the Cartesian plane of the linear inequality x is greater than 5. Now, why do I say this is confusing? Well, notice that you only see one variable in the inequality. x is greater than 5. There are no y's. So you might think I'm just talking about doing a problem on the number line, like I did a few minutes ago with you. But I said in the problem that I wanted you to graph the solution set in the Cartesian plane. And that means that you need to be working in the two-dimensional space of the Cartesian plane, not just the number line. Well, what do you do? Well, once you know that that's what you're supposed to be doing, working in the Cartesian plane, you do this problem just like you do all the other problems. You need to find the boundary line which splits the Cartesian plane into two pieces and then figure out which side of the plane to keep. So, what's our boundary line? Well, in this case it's going to be x equals 5. Okay, what kind of line do you have if the equation is x equals 5 and there's no y term. Do you remember? Well, when you have just x equals a number, you always have a vertical line. Think about it. What kind of points are on the line x equals 5? Well, 5 comma 0, 5 comma 7, 5 comma 11, and so on. And all of those points are on a vertical line where the x equals 5. So, once you know that your boundary line is just this vertical line at x equals 5, now you just need to ask yourself, which part of the Cartesian plane are you going to keep? Well, the original inequality was x needed to be just strictly greater than 5. So I need to pick all the points in the Cartesian plane where x is bigger than 5. And that means I'm going to choose all the points that are to the right of this vertical line, x equals 5. And once I've done that, I'm going to shade that part of the plane in, and I'll be done. Okay, now, after I've completed that example, uh, I need to ask myself, does that answer actually make sense? In other words, do I want all of these parts, or all these points, I should say, from quadrants 1 and 4? Well, all of those points have an x value greater than 5. So, indeed, you've got the right ones, and so you're good to go. Now, I'd like to move on to a word problem that demonstrates how you might want to look at a linear inequality to solve the problem. Here's the word problem. Your business sells two types of sneakers. For simplicity, let's just say one type is black and the other type is white. The profit on the black sneakers is $12 per pair, and the profit on the white sneakers is $8 per pair. How many pairs of sneakers must your company sell to make a profit of at least $400? That's the problem. One of the features of this question is the presence of the phrase, at least. I wanted to know that the profit would be at least $400.
And that's a hint that this is not a question about an equality, it's a question about an inequality. So let's proceed with that in mind and let's see if we can write down the right mathematical expression to take care of the problem. First, what do we do in these kinds of situations? We define the variables. So let's do it real simply. Let's let x be the number of pairs of black sneakers and let's let y be the number of pairs of white sneakers that we sell. That's simple. Now, what is our inequality? Well, based on that information about the profits, $12 on one type of shoe and $8 on another type of shoe, we know that in order to make at least a $400 profit, we need to write down this equation. 12 times x, or 12 times the number of black sneakers sold, plus eight times the number of pairs of white sneakers sold is at least or greater than or equal to 400. Notice that we used greater than or equal to instead of strictly greater. If the problem had asked for the profit to be more than 400, then I would have used strictly greater. But since it said at least 400, I used greater than or equal to. That's a real key in this example. So, I'm just trying to solve now the inequality 12x plus 8y is greater than or equal to 400. I do it the same way I did all the other examples so far. I'm going to look at the boundary line. 12x plus 8y equals 400, and I'm going to see where that line is located in the Cartesian plane. To do that, I'm going to write the equation in slope-intercept form. That way I can plot it pretty quickly. So, I've got 12x plus 8y equals 400. I subtract the 12x over to the right-hand side. We've done a lot of this together, so we move that 12x over to the right and it becomes negative 12x. And so I have 8y equals negative 12x plus 400. And now what do I want to do? I want to isolate that y. And the way I do that is to divide by 8. If you divide the left by 8, you must divide the right by 8. And you'll be left with y equals negative 12x over 8 plus 400 over 8. And if you simplify those fractions a little bit, you'll see that that's the same as y equals negative 3 halves x plus 50. Now, that equation is in slope-intercept form, and you've seen equations like that quite a bit in your previous lessons. So you should now be able to plot that line using a solid line because my inequality here is greater than or equal to and not just greater. So pull out a piece of graph paper and give yourself some units and once you've done that on the x and the y coordinates, you can plot this line. Now, that line cuts the xy plane into two pieces. There's a piece sort of below it and there's a piece sort of above it. And the question is, which one do you want? Well, the question really asks, how many pairs of sneakers must the company sell to make a profit of at least $400? There are lots of different ways the company could make at least $400. You could sell zero pairs of one type, the X type, and you could sell 50 pairs of the Y, and you would end up with a profit of $408. Or you could sell 100 of the first type and zero of the second type, and you'd end up with a profit of $1,200. And there are lots of other ways to answer the question. But it's okay to have lots of different answers. So what I really want to know is, what are all of the answers in this case? Which part of the plane do I actually shade? All right? So I go back to this region, and I ask myself, which one do I want to shade? Well, I want to shade the one where the values are greater than or equal to. In that case, I'm going to shade the part that is above the line. And so that's going to give me the solutions for this inequality. But let's not get lazy. If you look at that region for just a second, there are lots of points there where things don't make a whole lot of sense compared to the problem. For example, the point x equals negative 5 and y equals 100 is actually in the solution set. Just go plug in x equals negative 5 and y equals 100 into the original inequality. But that answer doesn't make any sense. How could you sell negative 5 pairs of black sneakers? 
you would definitely never want to go to your boss and say, hey boss, let's sell a negative number of pairs of sneakers. So, you need to be sure to remember the context of any word problem you do before you give the final answer to that word problem. Well, today we've talked about the idea of linear inequalities, which are a lot like linear equations, but with an equal sign being replaced by some sort of inequality sign. We've graphed the solutions of these linear inequalities, and we also saw how such inequalities might come up in a word problem. Next time we're going to turn a pretty significant corner, and we're going to begin talking about something called quadratic polynomials. These are expressions like 3x squared plus 7x plus 2. Notice that without the 3x squared, you would just have 7x plus 2, and that would be linear. We've studied those for a lot of lessons. But with the 3x squared thrown in, we have a totally different kind of expression in so many ways. So next time, we'll begin talking about these quadratic polynomials. I'll see you then. We've spent a number of lessons discussing linear equations which are of the form y equals mx plus b. Notice that the right-hand side of these equations include a linear term with x raised to the first power and a constant, a number, which we often call b. What if we added an extra term on that right-hand side, what's often called a quadratic term, or a term where the power on x is 2? And we looked at equations of that form. Let's call them y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. For example, we might consider y equals x squared plus 5x plus 4, or y equals 3x squared minus 8x plus 2. These are called quadratic equations. The term quadratic comes from the Latin word quadrare, which means to make square. And so sometimes we say that x to the power 2 is x squared. We'll spend several lessons speaking about quadratic equations, so I'll not try to say everything I can in this one lesson about quadratic equations. But I would like to spend some time sharing a number of thoughts by way of introduction. First off, the graphs of quadratic equations, like y equals 5x squared plus 7x minus 3, or y equals negative 2x squared plus 3x plus 4, have a special name. They're called parabolas. And I've shown you the graphs of two particular parabolas here. Now, I want you to notice the distinctive U-shape of each graph. It's interesting to note that both ends of each graph go in the same direction. They either both go up, or they both go down. This is very, very different from the graphs of the linear equations that we've seen in the past. Remember, when we graphed y equals mx plus b, one end would have been going down, and the other would be going up, or the other way around. The left-hand end might be going up, and the right-hand end might be going down. So, the whole concept of parabolas is very, very different. You have both ends either going in the same direction up or both going down. And this concept can throw a lot of students for a loop. It's just kind of weird to think that we can draw an equation even though that's exactly what we've been doing with straight lines. But now we have more shape to them. You might even think we have a real shape now, this U shape. And so it can be challenging to some students. So what I'd like to suggest is we break down where that U comes from and talk about why we know it really is going to be that shape. So first of all, what is telling that thing to be a U to go up or to go down in terms of the ends of the graph? Well, it turns out that it's nothing more than just the sign of the coefficient in front of the x squared term. When that coefficient in front of the x squared term is positive, the ends go up. So for example, in the equation y equals 5x squared plus 7x minus 3, 
the graph I know will go up in terms of its ends because the coefficient in front of x squared, which is 5, is positive. But if you hand me a different quadratic equation, like y equals negative 2x squared plus 3x plus 4, I immediately know that it'll be a parabola with the ends going down. And the reason that is is exactly because the negative 2, which is the coefficient of the x squared term, is negative. That's all we have to look for. Just that one clue in each quadratic equation tells us immediately whether the parabola goes up or the parabola goes down. Well, that's pretty cool, I think. You just have to watch for that one piece of information in order to figure out what the graph will look like. But what else can we say? Just because I know the ends go up doesn't mean I know exactly how to graph every parabola. Well, we could also talk about the x-intercepts of these parabolas. What do I mean by x-intercepts? They're going to be the places where the parabola crosses the x-axis. So here's a question to ask, which is kind of conceptual, but I think a very important one. Could there ever be more than two x-intercepts for a parabola? Well, the answer, of course, is no, because the parabola is just this U shape. So it would never have the ability to sort of come back down again and cross the x-axis a third time. Once that U shape has crossed the x-axis twice, it would not have the ability to wrap back down on itself, if you will, and make a third x-intercept. Okay, that's cool, but does it have to have, does every parabola have to have two different x-intercepts? Well, of course not. The parabola might sit right on the x-axis, for example, and only have one x-intercept. For example, if you look at the graph of y equals x squared minus 6x plus 9, you'll see that the parabola actually just sits. Looks like it's just sitting right on the x-axis. In fact, we can even see from that graph, if we draw it carefully on graph paper, that the x-intercept is exactly 3 x equals 3. So I can have parabolas that have two different x-intercepts. I can have a parabola, several parabolas in fact, with only one x-intercept. What about having no x-intercepts? Is it possible to have a parabola that misses the x-axis altogether? The answer is yes. Take for example y equals x squared minus 4x plus 6. What's true about that parabola? It actually sits completely above the x-axis. And again, it's never going to come back down, ever, so it will never cross the x-axis. It could have been the case, if I had given you a different quadratic equation, that you could have had a parabola that was going downward, but if it sat below the x-axis, then that parabola would also have no x-intercepts. So, there are lots of parabolas that have no x-intercepts, there are parabolas that have exactly one x-intercept. There are parabolas that have exactly two x-intercepts. And those are all the possibilities for the number of x-intercepts that can happen with a quadratic equation. For now, I really think that's enough to talk about when it comes to graphs of quadratic equations. I promise we'll talk more about their graphs in a future lesson. You might be saying, how would I know where to put it exactly in the Cartesian plane? I'll, I promise I'll share that with you in future lessons. But for today, I'd like to transition to more algebraic comments about quadratic equations. First, we're going to see many solutions, uh, I'm sorry, we're going to see many examples in math word problems where we're going to need a quadratic equation and we're going to need to multiply out the expressions in order to get those quadratic terms. So, to get our feet wet, I'd like to do some examples where we take different terms and multiply them together to get a quadratic polynomial or a quadratic expression. So, let's start with this example as a, as a starter. Let's simplify the product 5x times 8x minus 3, where the 8x minus 3 is in parentheses. Now, what do I mean by the command simplify here? What I really mean is I want you to multiply it out or I want you to expand the product. And to do that, I'm going to need the distributive property, 
which tells me how to distribute the 5x into parentheses. Now, we've been using the distributive property already. We used it in previous lessons. But now I want you to notice that I'm actually distributing a thing with a variable in it. Often we were just distributing numbers here and there into the parentheses. But today, we're actually going to distribute variables and numbers, terms like 5x in this example, into the parentheses. Is it any different from what we were doing before? Absolutely not. It might make the algebra a little more complicated because we'll get different powers of x. But beyond that, it's the exact same technique, the exact same rule. So let's expand this 5x times 8x minus 3 by distributing the 5x into the parentheses. Here we go. The 5x has to be multiplied with the 8x, and it gets multiplied with the negative 3, and you get 5x times 8x minus 5x times 3. The 5x times 8x can be written slightly so that the 5 and the 8 are next to each other. Remember, we're allowed to multiply these terms in any order that we want. And so 5x times 8x is the same as 5 times 8 times x times x. And that quantity is going to be 40 from the 5 times 8 times x squared, or x to the second power. So the first term is going to be 40x squared. What's left? Well, there's a minus 5x times 3. And again, I can put the 5 and the 3 together. 5 times 3 is 15, and the x doesn't really have a buddy to multiply with, so it just comes along, and I get 15x with a minus sign in front because there was a minus sign in front before. So 5x times 8x minus 3 is the same as 40x squared minus 15x. Now I want you to notice something very important as we transition out of all of those lessons we've done on linear expressions into this first lesson on quadratic expressions. We started with 5x and 8x minus 3. By themselves, those are both linear. If you had had y equals 5x and y equals 8x minus 3, both of their graphs would have been straight lines. But now when I multiply them together, or when I take their product, to use the fancier language, we get back a quadratic expression, 40x squared minus 15x. And this is going to be a very common way to get quadratic expressions. We're going to construct them by multiplying two linear expressions, things where the x is only raised to the first power, and by multiplying two of those together, we can get an x squared term to pop out. Of course, we could also go backwards and factor out the common term from the quadratic polynomial. And in fact, this is a very important technique with quadratic expressions as well. So now I want to sort of do the opposite of what we just did by considering the following example. I want us to factor out the greatest common factor in the expression 10x squared plus 20x minus 40. Now you might be saying to yourself, what in the world is the greatest common factor? Well, the greatest common factor of 10x squared plus 20x minus 40 is the largest factor that appears in each of the terms 10x squared, 20x, and 40. So I want to know what's the biggest thing that I could factor out of each of those three at the same time. So let's factor each of the terms separately and look for this greatest common factor. Well, 10x squared is the same as 2 times 5 times x times x, okay? 20x is 2 times 2 times 5 times x. And 40 is 2 times 2 times 2 times 5. So I do those three factorizations, and now what I want to know, if I want the greatest common factor, is what pieces appear in all three of those factorizations at the same time? Well, notice there's a 2 in every one of those factorizations, and there's also a 5 in every one of those factorizations, and there's nothing else in common with all three of the terms. For example, there aren't two 2's in all three of the terms. And in fact, there, aren't an, there isn't even an x in all three of the terms because the 40 doesn't have an x in it. So the greatest common factor then is going to be a 2 multiplied with a 5, and 2 times 5 is 10. And what does that mean? It means that 10x squared plus 20x minus 40 can be written as 
10, that's my greatest common factor, times some big thing. Well, what is that thing? I'll call it something. I'm going to have 10 times something equals 10x squared plus 20x minus 40. Well, if you start to look at how you would pull a 10 out, almost like peeling it out of each term, you'll see that 10x squared, of course, is just 10 times x squared. 20x is the same as 10 times 2x, and 40 is the same as 10 times 4. And now I see that I can factor that 10 out of every one of the terms and just write it as 110 out in front of x squared plus 2x minus 4. So what we have done by starting with 10x squared plus 20x minus 40 and rewriting it as 10 times x squared plus 2x minus 4, we have factored out the greatest common factor of that expression. And that's going to be very, very important as we move forward with factoring techniques in later lessons. We will always want to be able to factor out the greatest common factor. Well, let's do one more example along these lines of greatest common factors. This is not something we want to rush through. So let's look at the following. Let's find the greatest common factor of 10x squared plus 20x. Notice there's no 40 at the end of that. I just want 10x squared plus 20x. We've already factored the 10x squared and the 20x. They are 2 times 5 times x times x and 2 times 2 times 5 times x. Now, what do these two factorizations have in common? Well, notice that both of them have at least one 2. Notice that one of them only has exactly one 2. But both of them have a 2. Both of them have a 5. And now, both of them actually have an x as well. So the greatest common factor of this new quantity we're looking at is 2 times 5 times x, which is 10x. And what that tells me is I can factor out a 10x from 10x squared plus 20x. When I do that, I see that 10x squared can be written as 10x times x, and 20x can be written as 10x times 2. Do you see that 10x that they both have sort of floating around in there? You can now pull that 10x out in front. And what you're left with after you remove those 10x's and write it out in front, you're left with just a new term inside parentheses of the form x plus 2. The x is coming from that extra x, and the 2 is coming from the fact that you had 10x times 2 at the end. Well, we've now seen how to multiply a polynomial by a single term called a monomial when it's just got one term in it. And we know how to factor out a greatest common factor. For example, in the previous example, I was looking at 10x. That was factoring out a monomial because it just has one term in it, 10x. Nothing else is being added or subtracted to it. So what's the next thing to do? Well, the next thing to do is to multiply binomials. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, a binomial is a sum or a difference of two terms. You've heard things like bicycle, which has two wheels. Well, a binomial has two pieces being added or subtracted together. So 2x minus 1 is two terms being added together, a 2x and a 1. Actually, they're being subtracted. x plus 5 is two terms, an x and a 5 being added together. 5x minus 7, two terms, 5x and a 7 being subtracted from one another. All of those are called binomials. And I want you to notice that they look like linear expressions, don't they? Because the x in each of the things I just mentioned is raised to the first power. What I'd like to do now is multiply or expand things like x plus 5 times x minus 3, or 2x minus 1 times 5x minus 7. Now that may be a little silly looking to you. Maybe you think, ah, do I really need to know this? Believe it or not, the ability to multiply such binomials together is extremely important when we start talking about quadratic equations. So I want to do several examples now as we finish out this lesson together today where we're just multiplying these two binomials together. So let's start with this example. Expand x plus 5 times x minus 3. One of the most often used approaches to multiplying this kind of thing is called the FOIL method. 
you are going to hear me say FOIL many, many, many times in this course. What in the world does FOIL stand for? Well, the F stands for first, the O stands for outer, the I stands for inner, and the L stands for last. So, in this case, the first terms would be the X and the X, because they're the first terms in both sets of parentheses. The outer would refer to the sort of outer edge. That would be the X that's on the first term, the first binomial, and the minus three that's on the last, or latter end, the outer edge, of the second binomial. The inner refers to the inner two terms. That would be the five and the X from the second binomial. And the last refers to the last terms in each binomial. That would be the five and the negative three. And therefore, therefore the FOIL method for expanding X plus five times X minus three says we should do the following. And this is extremely important, so I'll try to walk through it carefully. X plus five times X minus three is going to equal X times X, that's the F in FOIL for the first terms, plus X times negative three, that's the O in FOIL, that's the outer terms, plus five times X, which is the I for inner terms. See the five and the X are sort of on the inside there. And then finally we add five times negative three. And the five and the negative three are the L. They are the last terms in each of their respective binomials. Now, what have I done? What I've really done is just multiplied every possible thing inside the first set of parentheses with every possible thing inside the second set of parentheses. And that's exactly what you have to do when you multiply these two things together. But once you've written that down, it's pretty easy to just sort of combine it all together. The x times the x becomes x squared. The negative three with the x becomes a negative three x. The five multiplied with the x becomes five x. And that five multiplied with a negative three becomes negative 15. Notice we can't get away from multiplying sign numbers. We've been doing it a lot in this course. And now when you string all that together, you have x squared minus three x plus five x minus 15. And here's the only question you have to do to finish. What can be added together? Which terms are like terms so that you can combine some of the terms? Well, I only see an x squared. Uh, there's not multiple x squareds floating around. So the x squared doesn't have anything to be added or subtracted with. But notice the minus 3x and the plus 5x. They're both basically an x term with different constants in front. Minus 3x plus 5x is exactly plus 2x. So those can be combined. And the minus 15, you can't do anything with it either. So the final answer here for multiplying out x plus five times x minus three is exactly x squared plus two x minus 15. Now that may have seemed complicated. And if this is your first time to see the FOIL method, I would completely understand. But I promise that this will make much more sense after you do a lot of examples. So before we move to another FOIL example, let me quickly point out that we just used two linear expressions, an x plus five and an x minus three, multiplied together to give us a quadratic, x squared plus two x minus 15. Okay, let's move to another example so we can practice this FOIL together. Let's multiply out or expand two x minus one times five x minus seven. Now, this example looks a bit more complicated. I threw a coefficient in front of the x to give me two x, and I threw another one in front of an x to give me a five x. But all I need to do again is FOIL. So here we go. Two x minus one times five x minus seven is two x times five x, that's the f, plus two x times the negative seven, those are the outer pieces, plus negative one times the five x, those are the inner pieces, plus negative one times negative seven. Those are the two last pieces in each of the binomial terms. And now you just multiply it all out. Two x times five x is 10 x squared. 10 coming from the two times five, x times x is x squared. Plus you have two x times negative seven, that's negative 14 x. Then you have negative one times five x, which is a negative five x. And then negative one times negative seven, be careful, that's positive seven. And that leaves us with 
10x squared minus 14x minus 5x plus 7. Notice again that the middle two terms can be combined, the minus 14x and the minus 5x, to give you minus 19x in the middle. And that's all you can do to simplify this, so that your final answer is 10x squared minus 19x plus 7. Well, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, these quadratic expressions can naturally show up in word problems as well. For example, someone might give you a sketch of a rectangle with side lengths 2x minus 1 and 5x minus 7 and ask you to find that expression for the area of the rectangle. Well, the area of a rectangle is length times width. So if the length is 2x minus 1 and the width is 5x minus 7, then their product, 2x minus 1 times 5x minus 7, will give you the area of the rectangle. And that's what we started with in our earlier example. So we were actually working with something that could have been in a word problem if we wanted. Now, I'd like to turn a corner in the lesson to discuss expanding some very special products that are related to quadratic expressions. So let's start with the following. I want us to expand x minus 7 squared. Now, that doesn't look like the examples I did earlier. In the two examples I did earlier, I had an x plus or minus something multiplied by a different x plus or minus something. Now, I'm actually saying just take one thing, x minus 7, and square it. Is that really like the previous examples? Well, think about it. When you say something squared, you just mean that thing times itself again. So x minus 7 squared is the same as x minus 7 times another x minus 7. Does that look like what we've been doing earlier? Yeah, sure it does. Once I've written it as x minus 7 times x minus 7, I can now FOIL again. I promised I'd be saying FOIL a lot, and I, I really meant it. So let's multiply out x minus 7 times x minus 7 with FOIL. Well, you're going to have x times x, that's the F in FOIL for firsts, plus x times a negative 7, that's the O, plus the negative 7 on the inside with the x on the inside, that's the I, and then you'll have the negative 7 with the negative 7. That's the L for last pieces of each binomial. Multiply them out. x times x is x squared. The x times negative 7 is negative 7x. The other term also gives you a negative 7x. And then the last term gives you plus 49. Negative times a negative is a positive. Combining those two middle terms, which are the only two that are like terms, you're going to have x squared minus 14x plus 49. Where does the 14 come from? It's just 7 added with 7. So I have x squared minus 14x plus 49. That's the same as x minus 7 whole thing squared. Let's try another example that kind of feels like this, but is a little more extended. Let's expand 4t plus 5 whole thing squared, okay? Again, I want to use FOIL to multiply this out, so I need to go, I need to write 4t plus 5 times another 4t plus 5. That's what it means to have a square, and now I'm going to FOIL. Well, and it looks a little more complicated because those 4s, but it's not, so let's just jump into it. The 4t times the 4t, those are the first terms, plus the 4t out here times the 5, that's the O, plus the 5 times the 4t, that's the I, plus the 5 times the 5, that's the L. It's that simple. Well, okay, maybe it doesn't look simple, but once you've written that out, all you have to do now is just multiply everything together, add the like terms, and you're done. It's a very nice recipe, a very nice rule for doing these kinds of problems. Now let's multiply the terms together. 4t times 4t, Ugh. 4 times 4, that's 16. t times t is t squared. So 4t times 4t is 16 times t squared. Perfect. Now, 4t times 5, that's 20t. 5 times 4t, that's also 20t. And 5 times 5 is 25. So once I've foiled, I have 16t squared plus 20t plus another 20t, plus 25. Those two 20 t's in the middle are like terms because they both include a t to the 1. So I can add them together. 20 t plus 20 t is 40 t. 
And so I have 16t squared plus 40t plus 25. Now, I'd like to look at one more very special type of example which is known as a difference of two squares just to give you a feeling for this before we close out our lesson. Here's the example. I want to multiply out or expand x minus 7 times x plus 7. Okay, pretty straightforward looking problem. Notice that the 7's are the same but there are different signs inside each of the two pieces of uh, each of the two parentheses. So, x minus 7 times x plus 7. Let's foil x times x minus the 7x plus the 7x minus 49. In fact, I think I just said that as phi-ol instead of foil. <laughs> if you really wanted to foil, it would be x times x plus 7x minus 7x minus the 49. Now notice what happens to the middle two terms. You have plus 7x and you have minus 7x. What are you going to have when you add those two together? 0x. I'm not going to write 0x as part of my final answer though. All I'm going to have that remains is x squared minus the 49. The middle term goes away. And notice that x squared minus 49 is a difference of two squares. Remember, difference means subtraction. x squared, of course, is a square. And 49 is 7 times 7. So when I write down x squared minus 49, I have a difference of two squares. And you'll be seeing differences of two squares throughout the next several lessons in this course. Well, today we've talked about the FOIL method and how important it is to multiply out these uh, binomial terms in order to get a quadratic expression. We'll be talking about this as well as quadratic expressions throughout the next several lessons. But in our next lesson, I want to start talking about one of the most important algebra topics that's related to quadratics, and that's called factoring trinomials. And I'll explain to you what a trinomial is in that next lesson. I'll see you next time. Welcome back. In the previous lesson, we talked about the FOIL method. And today I'd like to mention that it's very important that you have a grasp of that method, the FOIL method, before you continue on to this lesson. So make sure you've done some review of the FOIL method as we move forward today. We've spoken about quadratic polynomials of the form ax squared plus bx plus c, where a, b, and c are some numbers. One of the most important things we'll want to do is solve equations that involve these kinds of expressions. Those equations are going to look like ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. Why? It's a great question to ask. Why will we need to solve these kinds of equations? Well, because the values of x, which are the solutions of this equation, are very, very special. They're called the zeros of the equation because they are the x-intercepts of the graph of the function ax squared plus bx plus c. So we really need to be able to solve equations like ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. Okay, well what can we do to solve an equation like, let's say, x squared plus 8x plus 7 equals zero? Well, there are actually a lot of different approaches to that kind of a problem. But in this lesson, I want us to focus on one of the most important and most popular approaches to solving such a problem. It's called factoring. So let's start with the following example. I want us to factor the expression x squared minus 8x plus 7. So how do we even start? Well, what do I mean? I want to write down x squared minus 8x plus 7 in a factored form. And the factored form is going to look like x plus m times x plus n, where m and n are just some numbers. Basically, it's the opposite of doing the FOIL method. I'm trying to undo the effect of FOILing x plus m times x plus n to get back to the expanded 
polynomial. So this lesson is all about thinking about FOIL backwards, basically. The issue is just figuring out what these numbers m and n ought to be so that we have the factored form of the polynomial we started with. That's the key. And that's why it's so important that we understand the FOIL method, because we need to now think about it basically backwards. Well, first of all, if the factorization of the polynomial we began with really is of the form x plus m times x plus n, then when I multiply the m and the n together, I have to get the constant in the original expression, and that was 7. That is coming from the L in FOIL. When I multiply the number m times the number n, it has to be 7. That's coming from the L part of FOIL. Well, if you stop and think about it for a second, there are actually tons of ways to choose m and n so that m times n equals 7. For example, let's be a little silly about it. We could let m equal 121, and we could let n equal the fraction 7 divided by 121. If you multiply 121 times 7 over 121, the 121s will cancel, and m times n will just be 7. Well, that's true mathematically, but it's kind of silly. I'm going to assume throughout this lesson that m and n are actually whole numbers, that they are integers, so that the math is simpler for us. And now, if we make that assumption about m and n, it turns out that there aren't that many choices for what those two numbers can be. Think about it. What two whole numbers can you multiply together to get 7? Well, the choices are either 1 with 7, or maybe negative 1 with negative 7, or some other combination like that, maybe plus 1 with negative 7, and so on. So, for example, the factored version of the polynomial we started with might be, and I emphasize might be, x plus 1 times x plus 7. Well, once you've written down a guess, so to speak, for what the factored form is, how do you check your answer? Well, the answer is you do the FOIL method. So I'm going to now multiply out, or expand, x plus 1 times x plus 7 using the FOIL method to see what I get. So let's do it. x plus 1 times x plus 7 is going to equal x times x, that's the f part of FOIL, plus x times 7, that's the o part, plus 1 times x, that's the i part, plus 1 times 7, that's the l part of FOIL. And when you multiply that all out, you're going to have x squared plus 7x plus 1x plus 7. And remember from our previous lesson, the 7x and the 1x are going to be similar terms. They can be put together, and 7x plus 1x is 8x. So when I multiply out x plus 1 times x plus 7, I get x squared plus 8x plus 7. Now, what was I trying to factor? I was trying to factor x squared minus 8x plus 7. Ugh, we're close, but the sign on that little 8 in the middle is wrong. And that means that whatever I chose in the beginning for the two numbers, m and n, need to be, needs to be changed just a bit. So let's try a different uh, choice for m and n. What about taking x plus 1 times x minus 7? Let's just try it. We're learning about this for the first time. So let's just try a few different options. If we expand x plus 1 times x minus 7, we're going to get x squared plus x times the negative 7, that's the O term, plus 1 times x, that's the I, plus 1 times negative 7. All right, and if you multiply that stuff out, you're going to have x squared minus 7x plus 1x minus 7. Again, the middle terms will combine. They are like terms. Negative 7x plus 1x is negative 6x. So when I expand this quantity, I'm going to have x squared minus 6x minus 7. Now, I don't know about you, we've actually really messed this thing up now, because not only do we no longer have an 8 in the middle, but we've also messed up the sign in front of the 7 at the end. Remember, I want a plus 7 at the end, not a minus 7. So, let's try one more option, and just a hint, 
This is the right one. So stay with me as we do this. I wanted you to see some of the others because you have to go through this same thinking process of trying to figure out which of these options is right. So now that we've gone through a couple that aren't going to work, let's do the one that does. Let's choose x minus 1 times x minus 7. Well, when I FOIL that, I'm going to have x times x minus 7 times x, that's the O part, minus 1 times x, that's the I part, and then I'm going to have plus a negative 1 times a negative 7. Okay, that's going to give me x squared minus 7x minus 1x, and then the negative 1 times the negative 7 is plus 7. Remember, when you multiply two negative numbers together, you actually get a positive number back. And if I combine the like terms in the middle, I will have x squared minus 8x plus 7. That's exactly what we wanted. So I now know how to factor x squared minus 8x plus 7. It's exactly equal to x minus 1 times x minus 7. Now, before we move to another example, let's notice a few things from the example that we just did, because we're going to try to get a, a system down here for how to do these factorings. It's very, very important that we do that. First, I want you to notice that the sign in front of the constant term at the end, which is coming from the L part of the FOIL, it's going to be positive if the signs of the two binomial terms are the same whether they're both positive or both negative. In the example we just did, when I had a minus 1 and a minus 7 inside the factored parts, multiplying them together gave me a plus 7. And of course, when I had plus 1 and plus 7, multiplying those together gave me plus 7. So when the signs inside the two binomial terms are the same, the constant term after I multiply will be positive. But there was another case where I took a plus and a minus inside the binomial terms. When we multiplied that out, I got a negative 7. So when the sign of those constants are different inside the binomial terms, the product will give me a negative constant at the end. This is actually a very important clue when you're trying to factor a quadratic expression. So that's one very important rule that I'll try to walk through in some more examples in a moment. The second comment I want to make is that the middle term in the quadratic expression, like the negative 8x that we had in the example we just did, comes from adding the O and the I terms in FOIL. So for example, the negative 8x actually came from the negative 7x and the negative 1x, which were coming out of the O and the I. So bottom line, and this is very important, if you can juggle these two facts in your head, the fact that the L is giving you the constant piece and that the O and the I added together give you the middle term of your quadratic, factoring actually will come natural to you after you do some practice. So it's all about practice here, so let's do some more practice. Let's factor another quadratic. How about x squared plus 9x plus 20? Okay, I know that this quadratic expression is going to factor as a product of two linear binomial expressions. They're going to look like x plus m times x plus n. By the way, I know that because the x times the x is going to give me the x squared in x squared plus 9x plus 20, and the rest of the part from the FOIL will give me the 9x and the 20. I also know that the signs of both of the numbers inside the binomials, in other words, the sine of m and the sine of n, they will be positive because all of the coefficients in x squared plus 9x plus 20 are positive. So I'm good to go here. I don't even have to worry about minus signs in this problem. All I need now is to figure out what m and n ought to be. Well, Let's start by focusing on the L part of the FOIL method. Remember that the multiplication of M and N, which is coming from the L part of FOIL, has to equal 20, because 20 is the constant in my quadratic. So I have to ask myself, what kind of numbers could M and N be so that when I multiply them together, I get 20? Now I've chosen a case here where there are many different possibilities. For example, 
1 times 20 equals 20. 2 times 10 equals 20. And 4 times 5 also equals 20. And in some problems later on, you might have to worry about doing them in different orders. So instead of doing 2 times 10, you might have to think about 10 times 2. In this example, we don't have to worry about flipping the two terms around, but in some later examples, you might. The point is that there are lots of choices. So I'm going to suggest we just pick one of the pairs that I just mentioned and write them in as m and n and just multiply this thing out and see what we get. So let's just start with the 1 times the 20 very, very quickly. If I have x plus 1 times x plus 20 and I multiply the two together with the FOIL method, I'm going to have x squared plus 20x plus 1x plus 1 times 20, which of course is 20. I just marched through the F-O-I-L pretty quickly. And that gives me x squared plus 21x plus 20. 20x plus 1x is 21x. Now, is this the polynomial that I wanted? Well, notice that we got the 20 right, which is great, but the middle coefficient here was supposed to be 9, and we got 21. So the choice of 1 and 20 was not correct. But if we stop and think for a second, we might be able to figure out how to get a 9. Remember that the coefficient of the x term, the middle coefficient, in this case the 9 that we want, comes from the sum of the o term and the i term inside FOIL. In the case of x plus 1 times x plus 20, it's not an accident that we got 21 because 21 is 20 plus 1. And those are coming from the o and i terms. So what we really want in this example is a pair of numbers who multiply together to give you 20 and who add together to give you 9. Now remember what our pairs were? They were 1 times 20 or 2 times 10 or 4 times 5. Do any of those pairs add up to 9? The answer is yes, of course, 4 and 5. And so now I'm going to suggest that the factorization of x squared plus 9x plus 20 is actually x plus 4 times x plus 5. Let's just very, very quickly check that. x plus 4 times x plus 5 would be x squared plus 5x plus 4x plus 4 times 5, which is 20. And if you add all that up, adding the like terms in the middle, of course, you'll have x squared plus 9x plus 20, and you're done. So the factorization of x squared plus 9x plus 20 really was x plus 4 times x plus 5. Now, I want to make a very clear point here. Notice how this factoring process is actually just making us think about the FOIL work in reverse. We're just FOILing backwards. And if we have FOILing down really, really well, then doing the FOIL backwards in our head actually will work. It just is going to take some practice. So you want to make sure you spend the time really nailing down the FOIL process. Okay. Let's move forward now to another example because there's lots of different things that can happen. I promise I've shown you two examples and they're important, but there are lots of other examples to show. So let's factor this quadratic expression, x squared minus 3x minus 40. Okay, we know that we can start by writing down two sets of parentheses and we can put an x in front of the first and we can put an x in front of the second. Now, what can we say about the signs inside of those two sets of parentheses? That's very, very important. Do you remember how we, what we need to look for in order to figure out those signs? The answer is we need to look at the sign of the constant in the quadratic that we started with. The constant there is negative 40. It's there on the end. And that sign is negative, of course, because the negative's in front of the 40. Since that number's negative, the sign that we put inside each parenthesis needs to be different. In other words, I need to have x minus in one of the sets of parentheses, and I need to have x plus in the other set. And that's because when I do the FOIL process at the end of it, I'll have a negative number times a positive number for the L part, and a negative times a positive is negative, and I want negative 40. So, Believe it or not, you've actually written down most of the factorization. You now have x minus something and x plus something else. 
And now we just need to fill in what those somethings are. Now, what are they going to be? Well, they need to be two numbers whose product gives us 40. Now, I've chosen this example carefully because there are lots of ways you can get two integers to multiply together to give you 40. 1 times 40, 2 times 20, 4 times 10, 5 times 8. And you know, if you think about it for a second, just knowing your multiplication facts quickly is extremely helpful in factoring. And of course, you've been doing multiplication facts for a long time. Here's an example of where they really come in handy because you need to be able to know how to get two numbers whose product is 40. Now let's try one of the pairs that we just wrote down or we just mentioned and see if plugging in that pair of numbers into the two binomials actually gives us our factorization. So I'm going to choose the 2 and the 20 because 2 times 20 gives me 40. And so that means I'm going to write down x minus 2 times x plus 20. Okay, let's FOIL. I told you we're going to say FOIL a lot. Let's multiply these out. x times x is x squared plus 20x, those are the outer terms, minus 2x, those are the inner terms, minus 40. Notice that minus 2 times plus 20 is minus 40 or negative 40. So you have x squared plus 20x minus 2x minus 40. 20x minus 2x can be simplified to 18x because again, those terms are like terms. They have the same power of x in them. And so I have x squared plus 18x minus 40. Well, we got the correct constant term. We rigged it that way if you think about it. We got the negative 40. The question is, did we get the whole polynomial, the whole expression the way we wanted it? And the answer is no, because we just got an 18x. What we want is a negative 3x. Now, where did the 18 and 18x come from? Well, if you go look at that foil for just a second, you'll realize that the 18 came from 20 minus 2. And that, that's because the signs inside those binomials were different. You had a plus in one of them and a minus in the other. So what I then want is a pair of numbers who I can multiply together to get 40, but whose difference now is negative 3, because one of the numbers is going to be subtracted from the other. You getting the idea here? You have to juggle these two pieces of information and make them both work out at the same time in order to get the right factorization. So let's look at the pairs of numbers again that multiply together to give us 40 to see if any of them have the property that subtracting one from the other will give us a 3. Well, you got 1 times 40, but of course, if you subtract 1 from 40, you get 39. That's nowhere near what we want. You have 2 and 20. 20 minus 2 is 18, still not helpful. 10 and 4, 10 times 4 is 40, but 10 minus 4 is 6. That's still a little bit too big. And then you have 5 with 8, and of course 8 minus 5 is 3. Well, that's a hint that the 5-8 pair is what we want. But you know what? We're not done, because you still have two possibilities going on. You might have x minus 5 times x plus 8, or you might have x minus 8 times x plus 5. You see the difference there? I've put one of the numbers in the first with the minus sign, and I've put the other number in with the second set of parentheses with the plus sign. Which one is it? I want the middle term to be negative 3x. Well, I'm going to tell you right now which one it is. It's going to be the x minus 8 times the x plus 5. And if you already saw that, fabulous. If you didn't yet, it's going to come with practice, I promise. But let's check to make sure that x minus 8 times x plus 5 really works. Let's FOIL it out to see if we get what we want. Well, x minus 8 times x plus 5, when we multiply it by FOIL, is going to give us x squared plus 5x minus 8x and then minus 40. Again, negative 8 times plus 5 is negative 40. When I combine the two middle terms, the 5x minus the 8x, I'm going to have negative 3x. 5 minus 8, negative 3. And that means that my polynomial, once I multiply out these two binomial terms, is going to be x squared minus 3x minus 40. Perfect. That's exactly what we started with. And so I know my factorization is x minus 8 times x plus 5. Now, 
Let's ramp up the level of difficulty just a bit by considering the following problem. Let's factor 2x squared minus 11x plus 12. Now, do you see how this example is different already? Notice that coefficient in front of the x squared. It's a 2 this time, not a 1. Earlier it was a 1, right? Because I had 1x squared, basically. Oh, gosh. What are we going to do? Can we handle it with that 2 in front? Is it somehow really weird? No, it's not. Just stay with me. First of all, draw your sets of parentheses, okay? Leave them blank on the inside if you want. Draw them nice and big. And now here's what you're going to do. We've been starting by writing x with another x. But of course, when you multiply those two, you'll actually get a x squared. You won't get 2x squared. You'll just get 1x squared. How are you going to handle a 2? Well, inside your parentheses, you're going to write an x in one of them, and you're going to write a 2x in the other. So let me suggest we put the 2x in the first set of parentheses and an x inside the second set of parentheses. Uh, could we write it the other way? Could we put an x in the first and a 2x in the second? Of course. But I'm going to put the 2x in the first and the x in the second. If you want to try it later in the other direction, you certainly can. Once you've written the 2x inside the first set of parentheses and the x inside the second, you realize that when you do the f part of FOIL, you'll have 2x squared and you'll be in good shape. Now, let's think of the signs that we put inside the two binomials. That's usually the next step we try to think about. Well, the sign in front of the 12 in the quadratic expression that I gave you is positive. That means that the signs inside the two binomial pieces must be the same. Now, they might both be positive or they might both be negative at this point. The next thing to do is to look at that middle term which is negative 11x that was in the original quadratic expression. It's negative. What does that mean about the two signs that we need to put in the binomial pieces? Well, they have to be minus signs. Look, if you made them plus signs, then everything would be positive when you multiplied out the two binomials. So we must make both of the signs inside the parentheses minus. That means up to this point you should have 2x minus blank times x minus blank written on your page inside two sets of parentheses. Believe it or not, you're actually almost done now. Because all you need to do is find the two numbers to plug in inside the binomials and you'll be done. And what must be true about those two numbers? Well, the product of those two numbers needs to be 12 because that's coming from the L in FOIL and the 12 is the constant term in the original quadratic that we were given. Now, how many ways can you get a 12 when you multiply two whole numbers together? Well, now you actually have to start thinking about them in different orders. So you might have 1 and 12. You might have 2 with 6. 2 times 6 is 12. You might have 3 with 4. You might have a 4 with 3. You might have a 6 with a 2. Or you might have a 12 with a 1. Now, that's six different possibilities. Now, you could just kind of try them all. Um, unfortunately, that's not the best way to go because one of these days you might have a problem where there's a whole bunch of pairs, lots more than six. So we're going to want to come up with a way to think about what the pair ought to be. But for now, let's just try one of them and see if it actually works out. Let's use a six with a two. In other words, I want to write down 2x minus six and an x minus a two. Maybe that's my factorization. The only way I'm going to know is if I multiply everything out and see if I get the original polynomial back. So let's FOIL. 2x minus 6 times x minus 2 is going to be the following. The f in FOIL is going to be 2x times x. That's fine. That's 2x squared. The outer part is going to be the 2x with the negative 2. Nothing wrong with that. I just took the outer piece from the first binomial and the outer piece from the second. That's 2x with the minus 2. The inner piece is going to be negative 6 times the x on the inside. And the L part is going to be the negative 6 times the negative 2. And now we just have to simplify. You know, we did a lot of this in previous lessons. Now you know why. Because simplifying these expressions is very, very important. And when you do that, you're going to have 2x squared, of course. 2x times x is 2x squared minus a 4x 
minus a 6x and then plus 12. Negative 6 times negative 2 is positive 12. And now the two middle terms will combine. And negative 4x added to a negative 6x is the same as negative 10x. So you have 2x squared minus 10x plus 12. Now what were we trying to factor? Oh, well, that, we're really close. We were trying to factor 2x squared minus 11x plus 12. So we're close, but close doesn't count here. We've got to get it exactly right. Now you have five other possibilities, but I don't want to just try them all. So let's try one that, okay, is going to work. Here it is. Take 2x minus 3 with an x minus 4. Remember, I know that the 3 and the 4 are a possible pair to put at the end of each binomial because 3 times 4 is 12, and I want 12 as my constant. Okay, let's FOIL out 2x minus 3 times x minus 4. You're going to have 2x with x. You're going to have a minus 4 with the 2x. You'll have a minus 3 with the x. And then you'll have a minus 3 multiplied with a minus 4. And if you simplify all that, you're going to have 2x squared minus 8x minus 3x plus 12. Minus 3 times minus 4 is plus 12. The negative 8x in the middle with the negative 3x, those two will combine to give you negative 11x because negative 8 minus 3 is negative 11. And guess what? You now have the quadratic expression that you wanted to factor. 2x squared minus 11x plus 12. Notice that that 2 in front of the x squared really didn't cause us any trouble at all. We just had to think a little bit more about how to tweak one of the binomial pieces by putting a 2 in front of one of the coefficients. Well, today we've talked about basically undoing the FOIL method in order to learn how to factor these new terms, these new expressions, which are quadratic expressions. It turns out that that's really exactly what we're doing. And so we need to be able to do the FOIL method well so that we can basically do it backwards. I want you to keep in mind that some of these factoring problems can take some time as you try to figure out exactly which pair of numbers to insert into the binomial factors. Don't get frustrated. Your time spent on working through these factorizations is well worth it. We're going to see this very important topic of factoring again in later lessons. In fact, next time I'm going to talk about factoring certain special types of quadratic equations. I'll see you then. In the previous lessons, we've talked about the FOIL process for multiplying two binomial expressions. Remember, FOIL stands for first, outer, inner, last. We also discussed how to factor general quadratic expressions like x squared minus 7x plus 12 and 2x squared plus 5x plus 3 by undoing the FOIL expansion of the product of two binomials like x minus 4 times x minus 3. We noticed then that the process of factoring is one of recognition, almost like solving a little mystery as we try to think backwards from the FOIL process to see what the factorization ought to be. In this lesson, we want to focus our attention on how to quickly recognize certain types of quadratic expressions whose factorizations are very, very special. And in this way, we can actually speed up our factoring process. So you should think of this as like adding extra tools to our factoring toolbox. The first kind of factoring I want to mention today involves quadratic polynomials, or quadratic expressions, where the constant term is zero, so that you don't see a constant term at all. So with that in mind, let's look at the following example. I want to factor x squared minus 18x. Now, I want you to notice that this is the same as the expression x squared minus 18x plus 0. I could add a plus 0 there if we really want to see the constant term, but since it's 0, we're just going to throw it out. 
Now, we could start our factoring process the way we did in the previous lesson by writing down parentheses and then x minus and another x minus and then working out what our constants should be. This was what we did in the earlier lesson when we were undoing the FOIL process. But this seems kind of strange here because the product of the constants, which is supposed to give us the number or the constant term in our quadratic expression, has to be zero. So we could write down x minus zero times x minus something else and just fill in the other constant in order to make everything work out okay. But this seems like more work than it really ought to be. It's just not worth it. And to be honest with you, I think that adding that zero really just gets in the way. So I want to make the following suggestion as we think about factoring these expressions. Notice that both of the terms in the polynomial we started with, x squared and negative 18x, have an x in common. Or to use some language that we had a few lessons ago, their greatest common factor of those two terms is x. That means an x can be factored out of that original polynomial immediately. If we write down x squared minus 18x as x times x minus 18 times x, we see that common x floating around in both terms. It can be factored out in the front. And when you do that, you have x times what's left. And what's left is x minus 18. Well, guess what? You just factored the polynomial that we started with. It looks a little bit different from our previous results, but it's really the same thing because x times x minus 18 is actually the same as x minus 0 times x minus 18 because x minus 0 is just x. So what's my point? My point is this. When you're handed a quadratic expression and the constant term is 0, you should immediately just look for the greatest common factor of the terms that you have and factor that out. Once you've done that, your factorization will be done. You won't have to think about undoing FOIL or anything along those lines if you're trying to factor a quadratic expression. So, as I said earlier, this is all about recognizing that kind of a special case. Now, to practice, let's do another example. It's always good to practice in mathematics to make sure we're really understanding what we're doing. So, I want you to factor 27x squared plus 21x. So, we have a quadratic expression. It's quadratic because the highest power on x is 2, that x squared term. And I want you to notice that the constant term is 0. It's just gone. There is no constant term there. So, all about recognition, I want to factor this polynomial without thinking about FOIL at all. Instead, I want to look for the greatest common factor of the two terms in the original expression, and I want to factor that out. So, let's ask ourselves, what is the greatest common factor of 27x squared and 21x? Well, let's factor these two terms. 27x squared is 3 times 3 times 3 times x times x, and 21x is 3 times 7 times x. So looking at those two sort of factored ways of looking at the terms, can we see the greatest common factor of the two terms? Well, they both have a 3 in them. Notice that the 27x squared has more than one 3 in it, but the 21x only has one 3 in it. So I'm going to keep one 3 in my greatest common factor, and notice that they both have at least one x in them as well. So I'm going to keep an x in the greatest common factor. And the greatest common factor here is 3x. So if I go back to the original polynomial, 27x squared plus 21x, and I pull out a 3x from each of those terms, then I will have the following. I'll have 3x times 9x, because that's 27x squared, plus 3x times 7, because 3x times 7 is 21x. Pulling out that common 3x from both of these pieces is going to leave me with a 9x plus a 7. And therefore, my factorization of 27x squared plus 21x is exactly 3x times 9x plus 7. 
Again, this could be written as 3x plus 0 times 9x plus 7 because 3x plus 0 is the same as 3x. I think that's overkill. I think it's too much to do. I would just write the final answer as 3x times 9x plus 7. Now, I'd like to look at another type of special quadratic expression that comes up when we're doing factoring, whose factoring can be done pretty quickly if we recognize it. So, in order to look at this kind of special family of expressions, let me remind you of some of the math work we've done in the past. We know from FOIL that if I take something like a plus b and I square it, it's the same as taking a plus b times a plus b. And if I FOIL that out, I'm going to get a squared plus ab plus basically another ab from the inner terms plus b times b from the l piece of FOIL and b times b is b squared. In other words, a plus b squared has a special look to it. It's a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. In a similar way, I could have a minus b whole thing squared, and that would be just a minus b times a minus b. And if I FOIL that out, I'm going to have a squared, a minus ab from the outer terms, a minus ab from the inner terms, and then I'm going to have a minus b times a minus b, which is positive or plus b squared. Minus times a minus is a plus. So for example, instead of all these a's and b's floating around, let's look at some actual polynomials where you got some numbers in there. What about x plus 3 whole thing squared? Well, it's going to be x squared plus a 3x plus another 3x, which is 6x, plus 3 times 3, which is 9. In other words, it's x squared plus 6x plus 9. Or you might have x minus 7 whole thing squared, which is going to be x squared, a minus 7x, another minus 7x, and then a plus 49. Or x squared minus 14x plus 49. I promised uh, in the last few lessons that you'd have to be able to FOIL well, and here we see ourselves FOILing once again. Make sure you're getting good if you aren't already, at FOILing. These kinds of polynomials that I talked about, x plus 3 whole thing squared and x minus 7 whole thing squared, are sometimes called perfect square trinomials because, first of all, they're trinomials. They have three terms in them, like x squared minus 14x plus 49. It has three terms in it, but they can be written as the square of a binomial. In other words, something like x minus 7 whole thing squared. So they're known as perfect square trinomials, and it turns out that if you are handed a perfect square trinomial and you recognize it as such, then you can pretty quickly write down the factorization. So if you notice that you have a quadratic expression whose squared term, that's the term in the front, typically, and whose constant term are perfect squares, then you might have a perfect square trinomial. So for example, if you have x squared in front and maybe the constant is 9 at the end, or x squared in front and the constant is 49 at the end, that's a hint that you might have a perfect square trinomial. You also need to look for a second thing in case you have a perfect square trinomial, and that is this. The middle term of the, of the expression needs to be exactly two times the product of one factor from the x squared and one factor from the constant term. So for example, if the middle term is 14x, that would be coming from two times one of the x's and one of the 7's if you were multiplying out x plus 7 times x plus 7. If your largest square term, the x squared, and the constant term are perfect squares, and the middle has this property of being two times a product of a factor from each of those, then you can quickly factor this polynomial. Now, all those words may have gotten confusing. I could understand that. So, let's look at an example. That's the beauty of mathematics. Let's factor x squared 
plus 16x plus 64. Okay, now, of course, I've been telling you all this stuff about perfect square trinomials, so now you might be looking for that. In general, if you're handed a, an expression that's quadratic like this, you're going to want to think about different things. But for now, let's see that this thing really is a perfect square trinomial. Notice that the x squared, of course, is just x times x. That's a perfect square. And the 64, which is the constant, hey, that's also a perfect square because it's 8 times 8. And again, I can't say enough that knowing these sort of arithmetic facts is very, very useful in the study of algebra. Knowing that 64 is a perfect square here is very helpful. So the front term, the x squared, and the constant term, 64, are both squares. That's a hint that we might have a perfect square trinomial here. That means we need to look at the middle term. In this case, it's 16x. Is 16x the same as 2 times the product of one of the factors out of the x squared and one of the factors out of 64? Well, 16x really is 2 times an x times 8. Remember, where's the 8 come from? 8 times 8 is 64. So the middle term here, 16x, really is 2 times the product of the x and the 8. That immediately tells us that we really are working with a perfect square trinomial, and that means that we know the factorization. x squared plus 16x plus 64 actually equals x plus 8 times x plus 8, or just x plus 8 whole thing squared. That's why it's called a perfect square. Now, if you wanted to check your answer here, what would you do? Well, you would take the x plus 8 times the x plus 8, and you would FOIL it, and you would see that you get x squared plus 16x plus 64. I'm going to leave that arithmetic, actually that algebra, to you to make sure that I really have the right factorization there. But I promise, x plus 8 whole thing squared really is the factorization for that expression. OK, let's try another one. Let's try another example where we might have a perfect square trinomial. Here's the example. I want you to factor 4x squared minus 36x plus 81. Now, this thing looks a bit daunting. I understand, but that's OK. Don't worry about it right now. Let's just see if we can look at this thing and figure out its factorization. Now, you might start out with something like factoring in the as an undoing of the FOIL process with 2x minus a big blank times another 2x minus another number here. And that would be OK. You could certainly do that. But I want to point out that it would be just as valid at the beginning of this process to write down 4x minus something times x minus something. Because 4x times x gives you 4x squared just like 2x times 2x gives you 4x squared. So already as we start, there are two whole different ways that we might be able to write down the factorization of this expression. Well, that's more than I really want to think about. So let's step back for a second and ask ourselves, do we have a perfect square trinomial here? Because if we do, we can write down the factorization very quickly. So let's look back at the original problem. The term in the front was 4x squared. Notice that 4x squared is the same as 2x times 2x, which means it's a perfect square because it's actually 2x whole thing squared, right? So 4x squared is a perfect square. Look at the constant term. The constant term there was an 81. And 81 is 9 times 9, or 9 squared. Well, what that means is that you are set up here for this to possibly be a perfect square trinomial. But as you were doing the problem, you'd have to recognize that immediately to know if that's where you were. So again, it's very important to recognize. Now, once we see that 4x squared and 81 are perfect squares, we actually have a hint at what the possible factorization is if the polynomial we were given, if the expression we were given, is a perfect square trinomial. It would have to look like 2x minus 9 
times 2x minus 9, or just 2x minus 9 whole thing squared. Where in the world did I get the 2x and the 9 from? Well, the 2x comes from the fact that 4x squared was 2x times 2x. And the 9 comes from the fact that 81 is 9 times 9. Where does the minus sign come from? Well, the middle term of the expression we started with had a negative sign in front. And that's why I need a, not a minus sign inside 2x minus 9. How do I check to see if this is right? This is all about just checking to see if you really get the right answer. You're really trying to just guess it at the beginning, which is okay. Well, let's foil out 2x minus 9 whole thing squared. That's the same as 2x minus 9 times 2x minus 9. And when you FOIL that, you'll have the following. 2x times 2x, then you have 2x times a negative 9, then you have negative 9 times 2x, and then you'll have negative 9 times negative 9. I just marched through the F, the O, the I, and the L in FOIL. And now if you simplify that, you're going to have 4x squared, because 2x times 2x is 4x squared, minus 18x, minus another 18x, and then you'll have plus 81 from negative 9 times negative 9. Well, the only like terms there are the negative 18x and the other negative 18x. And when you combine a negative 18x with another negative 18x, you get negative 36x, leaving you with a final answer of 4x squared minus 36x plus 81. Go back to the polynomial we started with, to the expression I started us with in this example. Is that what we wanted? Yes, it really is. So we know that the factorization of that expression, 4x squared minus 36x plus 81, the factorization of that expression is 2x minus 9 whole thing squared. Well, before we move to the last special type of quadratic expression I want to talk about today, I'd like to solve a brief word problem, actually, that involves these perfect square trinomials. So, let's look at the following word problem example. The area of a certain square is given by the expression 25t squared plus 40t plus 16. So it's 25t squared plus 40t plus 16. That's the area. I want to find an expression for the length of the side of the square, okay? So let's begin by noticing that the expression for the area is a quadratic expression because the t is raised to the second power. That's the highest power of t that you'll see. Notice that the variable is t instead of x. Not a problem. We can use t's instead of x's. Now, next, in any problem of this type, it would be smart to try to factor the expression that we were given. A factored version of the expression can tell you a lot of things. And so let's try to factor 25t squared plus 40t plus 16. Now, I'm hinting a little bit that this is, might be a perfect square trinomial because that's what we're talking about at this part of the lesson. But nevertheless, I want you to practice this recognition of these perfect square trinomials. First, if you want to see if it's a perfect square trinomial, you look at the front term and the constant term. Are they both perfect squares? Well, 25t squared is 5t whole thing squared. That's good. 16 is 4 squared. That's also good. So that's a hint that one way the 25t squared plus 40t plus 16 can be factored is 5t plus 4 times 5t plus 4, or 5t plus 4 whole thing squared. Remember where the 5t and the 4 come from. 5t squared, 5t whole thing squared is the 25t squared, and 4 squared is the 16. Now, let's check to see if this really is the factorization. I write down 5t plus 4 times 5t plus 4, and I get 5t times 5t plus 4 times 5t plus another 4 times 5t plus the 4 times the 4. I'm just foiling there. And when I multiply all that out, I get 25t squared plus 20t plus another 20t plus 16. Combining the middle terms, because they're like terms, gives me 25t squared plus 40t plus 16. And that was the expression we started with. 
and that's fabulous. Except we need to go back to the problem now and figure out what they asked us to do. So let's go back to it. The problem said that the area of the square is 25t squared plus 40t plus 16. I now know that that's equivalent to 5t plus 4 whole thing squared. I also know that the area of a square is exactly equal to its length times its length. In other words, its length squared. If the area is 5t plus 4 squared, and the area of a square is also the length squared, then I can deduce that the length is 5t plus 4. Because, of course, the area was 5t plus 4 times 5t plus 4. So the length of the side of that square is exactly 5t plus 4. And without the factored version of that expression for the area, we would have never been able to figure out that that was the length. Okay, now I want to turn a corner and I want to think about another special family of expressions that can be factored very quickly and it's all again about recognition. And these special expressions are called differences of two squares. I've referred to that a bit already in our lessons, but let me remind you again what that means. A difference of two squares simply means that I have two squares and I'm subtracting them one from the other. Remember the word difference means subtraction. So I'm just saying I'm taking one square minus another square. In some of our earlier mathematical work, we saw that if you took a squared minus b squared, it would be the same as a minus b times a plus b. So, for example, if you had x squared minus 25, it would be the same as x minus 5 times x plus 5. If you don't believe me, just foil out x minus 5 times x plus 5. And what you'll notice is, is that the O and the I terms from the foiling cancel each other out. So that, do you see what's missing from x squared minus 25? It's missing the x term, sort of in the middle, like a 7x or a 10x. It's completely missing. And all you have is the x squared minus the constant 25. Notice also, for example, if you had 9x squared minus 121, that's the same as 3x minus 11 times 3x plus 11. Now, to recognize that I had a difference of two squares, I needed to notice that 9x squared is the same as 3x times 3x. And I also needed to notice that 121 is the same as 11 times 11. So the factorization here is actually very quick if you notice that you're missing that x term. Missing that term in the middle is a clear sign that you might be dealing with a case of a difference of two squares. Of course, not every quadratic expression that's missing its middle term is a difference of two squares. I mean, think about something like x squared minus 3. It's missing its middle term, but it's obviously not a difference of two squares because 3 is not a perfect square of some integer, unlike 16, which is a perfect square because it's 4 squared. So if we can recognize these difference of two squares types of expressions, we can write down their factorizations extremely quickly. Again, it's all about recognition. So, Let's do a few more examples of these before we close out our lesson together. I want us to factor 25x squared minus 9. It's a perfectly good quadratic expression. 25x squared minus 9. And what I'm claiming today is that this can be factored very, very quickly without having to try to undo a FOIL or anything along those lines. Notice that 25x squared is a perfect square because it's 5x times 5x, which of course is 5x whole thing squared. Notice that 9 is a perfect square because it's 3 times 3, or 3 squared. And notice that the sign between the 25x squared and the 9 is minus. So I have a difference of two squares. And that means immediately I know that the factorization of 25x squared minus 9 is 5x minus 3 times 5x plus 3. Now, again, the reason that's true is because if you FOIL out 5x minus 3 times 5x plus 3, the 
the first terms will survive and give you the 25x squared. The last terms will give you the negative 9. And the O and the I terms will actually cancel with each other, leaving you with no uh, term in the middle, no x to the first power term in the middle. Okay? Let's factor another problem of this type. How about 400x squared minus 169? Now, your first thought is, whoa, those coefficients are way too big for me to try to think about this. But if you notice that you don't have the x term in the middle, one of the first things you might want to do is say to yourself, wait a minute, maybe this is a difference of two squares. And if it is, it means that you need to see if those two terms that they gave you actually are perfect squares. So what I want to do now is start thinking. 400x squared minus 169, are they both perfect squares? Well, 400 is actually 20 times 20. And 20 times 20 is 20 squared. So 400x squared can actually be written as 20x whole thing squared. Ooh, What about 169? Is it a perfect square? Now you've got to really start thinking about your arithmetic. Well, 169 is 13 times 13, or 13 squared. And therefore, what we were handed is a difference of two squares. And as soon as I know that, I know exactly what I should write down. The 400x squared needs a 20x in both of the binomials. And the 169 needs a 13 and a 13. And because I have a difference of two squares, I need one of the signs to be positive, and I need the other to be negative, and I'm done. My factorization is 20x minus 13 times 20x plus 13. Imagine if you wanted to do that example like we were doing in the previous lesson, where you just wrote everything down and started thinking about different factors. You would have been there a long time, probably. One more example of this type, and we'll close out our lesson together. Let's factor 5x squared minus 245. Well, we have a problem, actually. At this point, you might want it to be a difference of two squares. 5x squared, though, is not a perfect square. So what are we going to do? Well, I want you to step back and think for just a moment. 5x squared is not a perfect square, but I notice that there's a factor of 5 in the 5x squared, and actually there's a factor of 5 in 245. That means that 5 is acting like a common factor of these two terms. So let's factor out a 5 from both terms. You are always allowed, when you're factoring, to factor out a common factor. Always, always, always. So let's factor a 5 out of x squared, out of 5x squared, and let's factor a 5 out of the 245. When you do that, you will have 5 times x squared minus 5 times 49. Factoring out that extra 5, then, becomes 5 times the quantity x squared minus 49. And guess what? x squared minus 49 is a difference of two squares. It was hiding underneath. That 5, that extra 5, was just messing us up. And so I know how to factor x squared minus 49. It is a difference of two squares, and it's x minus 7 times x plus 7. 49 is 7 times 7. And therefore, the original polynomial that was given to us has the following factorization. 5 times x minus 7 times x plus 7. So what we notice in this example is that we've seen a mixture of two issues there. You had a difference of two squares, but it was being hidden by a greatest common factor. We needed to actually do both in order to factor that polynomial successfully. But we did it. It's a good job. We've spent some time talking today about some very special types of expressions, quadratic expressions, and how to factor them. My hope is that with practice, you'll be able to recognize these special expressions and use the tools we've discussed to quickly factor such expressions in the future. Well, we've now spent a good bit of time talking about factoring quadratic expressions. But to be honest, there are lots of quadratic expressions that we can't factor at all. So we need another set of tools for solving equations which have unfactorable polynomials, or unfactorable expressions. Next time, we'll talk about such a tool which is called the quadratic formula and is extremely helpful to us. I look forward to talking with you then.
We've seen a wide variety of approaches to solving quadratic equations. We now look at one last approach to solving such equations, which is called completing the square. Actually, completing the square is used for more than just solving quadratic equations. It's really a way to rewrite a quadratic function in a very special form, which tells us quite a bit about the shape of a quadratic function and the shape of the graph of the quadratic function. But before we go anywhere, let me pause and speak briefly about this word function, which I just used several times. What is a function? Well, in pretty basic terms, a function is a mathematical rule or relationship that assigns exactly one output value to each input value. Typically, our output values are the y values and our input values are the x values. So, for example, y equals 4x plus 2, or sometimes we'd write it as f of x equals 4x plus 2, is a function. If we plug in an input value like 5, we get back the output value 4 times 5 plus 2, which is 20 plus 2, or 22. So we've assigned or paired up 5 and 22. We could even write the ordered pair 5 comma 22, which should remind you of some of our earlier work when we graphed in the Cartesian plane. We could also write f of 5 equals 22 to use more functional notation if we want. And that notation tells us that we plugged 5 into f and out came 22. Let me also share a couple other vocabulary terms here quickly. The domain of a function is the set of input values that we are allowed to plug into the function. And the range of a function is the set of output values that come from the function. We'll talk more about domains and ranges of functions, not only in this lesson, but in later lessons in the course. So let's get back to the main topic of this lesson, which is completing the square. I'd like to look at an example to show you what we're going to be dealing with in this lesson. So let's get started with this example. Determine the smallest value of the quadratic function f of x equals x squared plus 6x plus 35. Now, let's first make sure we know what I'm asking for. The question is, what is the smallest output value of f of x? Or if we were graphing the function f of x equals x squared plus 6x plus 35, how low would the graph go in the y direction? So that's what I'm really asking for. How small is this function f of x? Or how low will its graph go in the y direction? One way to get a feel for this is just to plug in a whole bunch of numbers for x and see what the different y values are after we've plugged in those values of x. This will not tell us exactly what the smallest value of this function is, but it should give us a hint as to what's going on. So I'm just going to pick a number of different x values, plug those into the function, and see what happens. So let's do that. I'm going to choose the x values starting at negative 6, and then just growing those x values by 1 each time. So I'm going to plug in negative 6, negative 5, negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, and 1. Now, you might ask, where did you come up with those choices for the values of x? Well, part of the answer is, I know approximately where I want to look for those values of x. And so I would ask that you not worry too much about how to find those. At this point, I just want to plug those in. So let's plug them in quickly. When you plug in negative 6 for x, and you then do the simplifying that you have to do, the output value, or f of x value, is going to be 35. When you plug in negative 5 for x, the y value, or output value, that you're going to get is 30. When you plug in negative 4, the y value will be 27. When you plug in negative 3, the y value will be 26. Now, let me just pause here briefly. Notice that those y values, or output values, have been going down. So remember, we're trying to find the value where the function goes smallest, or where the y values are their smallest. So we see that they've been going down. That's a hint that we're in the right direction. We're looking in the right place. Now, after x equals negative 3 is x equals negative 2. And notice that when you plug in negative 2 for x, 
what comes out as a y value is 27. That means the function has now started going up again, its graph has, or if you just think of the y values as numbers, the numbers are starting to get bigger. When you plug in negative 1 for x, you get 30 back after you've done the arithmetic. When you plug 0 in for x, that's pretty easy, right? Because the zeros going in for x make all of the terms with an x in them 0, and then you just add the 35 at the end, and the y value is 35. Again, that's getting bigger as well. And then when you plug in 1 for x, you actually get 42. So it appears that the lowest y value that we're going to get is somewhere around 26, and that happened when x was equal to negative 3. But how can we be certain that this is the very smallest output value for this function f of x? The answer is the topic of this lesson, completing the square. So here's the idea. What if I could write the equation for f of x in a new way, in a different way, so that we could see where the smallest value is? Well, that would be a way to solve this problem, and that's exactly what completing the square does. Here's how. Start by looking at the first part of this equation, which was the x squared plus 6x. I'm going to hide that constant term, the number at the end, the 35, from my eyes, just for a moment. I'm going to look at the x squared plus 6x. What constant would I need to add to x squared plus 6x to get a perfect square trinomial? In other words, what value of a would we need so that x squared plus 6x plus a is a perfect square? Well, in this case, a would need to be 9 because x squared plus 6x plus 9 equals x times 3 times x times, sorry, x plus 3 times x plus 3 if you factor it. And of course, x plus 3 times x plus 3 is x plus 3 squared. Well, that's helpful. Now let's go back to the original expression, x squared plus 6x plus 35. I'm now going to add in and subtract out a 9 and rewrite the expression. Now you might say, why would you add in and subtract out 9? Well, of course, adding 9 in and then subtracting it back out is just 0. 9 minus 9 is 0. So I can add 0 in without changing the problem in any way. But by adding in the 9 and then subtracting out the 9, I can group together the x squared plus 6x with the plus 9 so that I have a perfect square in the front of the expression. And so I'm going to have x squared plus 6x plus 9 minus 9 plus 35. That's the same as the original expression except with a plus 9 minus 9 sort of inserted in the middle. I'm then going to group that plus 9 with the x squared plus 6x and the x squared plus 6x plus 9, I'm going to rewrite as x plus 3 whole thing squared. And that means that my function can be rewritten as x plus 3 whole thing squared minus 9 plus 35. The minus 9 plus 35 is equal to plus 26. And so the original function we started with is the same as x plus 3 whole thing squared plus 26. Now, with the equation written in this form, we've actually completed the square. And you might say, who cares? What in the world did that do for us? Well, here's what it did for us. The first part of the new expression, the x plus 3 squared, is never negative. Why? Because it's a real number squared. No matter what we plug in for x, x plus 3 whole thing squared is going to be at least 0. Even if you plug in a negative number for the x, let's say negative 7, the part on the inside of the parentheses will be negative, but when it gets squared, then that piece will be positive, or at least 0. So no matter what we allow x to be, we know that the function has to be at least 0 for the front part plus 26. And therefore, the function has to be at least greater than or equal to 26. Therefore, I know what the smallest value this function can be is. It's 26. And this is a proof of what we saw in the table of numbers that we looked at earlier in this example. 26 is the smallest 
this function can be. And I know that thanks to rewriting the original function using completing the square. So, this is actually the point of this whole lesson today. And that is, when we're given a quadratic function, can we rewrite it in the form x plus m squared plus n, or maybe negative in front of x plus m squared plus n, where m and n are just some numbers. For us earlier, we were able to get m to be 3 and the n to be 26. If I can rewrite my original quadratic equation or quadratic function in this new form, then I can interpret the information and it'll tell me a great deal about the function that we're studying. So, today I want to spend uh, several minutes talking about a number of examples where we complete the square and then interpret what that completing the square tells us. So, let's look at the following example. Complete the square for this expression, x squared minus 10x minus 23. Well, as with the previous example, I want to determine this coefficient that I need to complete the square if I just grouped the x squared minus the 10x. Here's a recipe for finding what that number is that you need to add in and then, of course, subtract out. You take the coefficient in front of the x term, not the x squared term, but the x term. Ignore the sign that's in front of it for just a second. That's going to be the number 10 for us in this example. I'm going to divide that 10 by 2. It's always dividing by 2, so just cut it in half. And then whatever I get from there, I'm going to square that new number. That's the recipe in every case when you want to complete the square here. In this case, that 10 divided by 2 is 5. And if I square 5, I get 25. And that means in order to complete the square, I need to add in a 25. But to be fair, or to be mathematically correct, I then have to subtract a 25 out as well so that everything balances. And that means that my new expression is going to be written as x squared minus 10x plus the 25 minus the 25 and then minus 23. Remember, there was a minus 23 dangling on the end of the expression when we started this example. Remember again, adding 25 and then subtracting 25 is like adding 0, and that doesn't do anything. Now I'm going to group the plus 25 with the x squared minus 10x. I'm just going to put parentheses around that just so I can see that those three terms are together. And I'll have x squared minus 10x plus 25 minus 48. The 48 comes from the minus 25 and the minus 23 being put together. And the x squared minus 10x plus 25 is the same as x minus 5 whole thing squared. It's a perfect square. And that means the original expression we started with is exactly the same as x minus 5 squared minus 48. And that means I know something about this algebraic expression. I know that the smallest value that will be taken on by the quantity x squared minus 10x minus 23 is exactly negative 48. It is the smallest output value, if you will, of the function f of x equals x squared minus 10x minus 23. So completing the square again helped me to see how low this function will go. I can now guarantee that the function will never equal anything less than negative 48. So it won't equal negative 50 or negative 100 or negative 200 or anything less than negative 48. Now, let's extend the work we just did in that example to solve an equation. Here's the equation I want us to solve. x squared minus 10x equals 23. Well, I know that the equation x squared minus 10x equals 23 is the same as x squared minus 10x minus 23 equals 0. All I did there was subtract the 23 over to the left-hand side. So we'll work now with this equation in that form. But that left-hand side ought to remind you of something. That was the expression we just completed the square of in the previous example. We determined that x squared minus 10x minus 23 could be rewritten as x minus 5 squared minus 48. And that means that the equation we originally started with is exactly the same as x minus 5 squared 
minus 48 equals 0. Or, if you add the 48 back to the right-hand side, x minus 5 squared equals 48. Now, I want to get x by itself. That's what it means to solve this equation for x. So I'm going to take the square root of both sides to get rid of the square on the x minus 5. When I do that, I'm going to get x minus 5 equals plus or minus the square root of 48. Now, I have to pause here and I have to say something very clearly. So uh, let me share this. This is very, very important. When you take the square root of both sides of an equation, you must take into account the plus or minus possibility. Why? Well, because, for example, the solutions of x squared equal 9 are x equals 3 and x equals negative 3. Think about it. Negative 3, if you plugged it into x squared, would give you negative 3 squared, which is the same as negative 3 times negative 3, which is plus 9. So negative 3 really is a solution. Now, that doesn't mean that the square root of 9 is 3 or negative 3. The square root of 9 is 3, period. Don't mix up the two ideas. Square roots of positive numbers are always just positive. But the solutions of an equation where you take the square root of both sides could possibly be positive or negative. So, let me go back to my equation now. It said that I had x minus 5 equals plus or minus square root of 48. Now, I'd like to clean up that square root of 48 a bit if I could. I'd like to simplify that. To do that, I'm going to factor the 48 quickly. 48 definitely has a 2 in it because it's even. So it's equal to 2 times 24. 24 still got a 2 in it because it's even. So I now know that 48 is 2 times 2 times 12. 12 can be written as 2 times 6, so 48 must be 2 times 2 times 2 times 6. And 6 is still even, so it has a 2 in it, which means I can write it as 2 times 3. And so I know 48 actually equals 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 3. Or 48 is actually 16 times 3, if you just group all those 2's together. And 16 is a perfect square. And that's a good thing to know, because it's equal to 4 squared. So square root of 48 is the same as square root of 16 times the square root of 3. I can rewrite the square root of 16 as just 4, and that means the square root of 48 is the same as 4 times the square root of 3. And so our equation now is x minus 5 equals plus or minus 4 square root of 3. Well, that plus or minus actually is a hint that we have two different equations. We have x minus 5 equals positive 4 square roots of 3, or x minus 5 equals negative 4 times the square root of 3. If I now just add 5 to both sides of these equations, it'll move the 5 over to the other side, and I'll have x equals 5 plus 4 times the square root of 3, or x equals 5 minus 4 times the square root of 3. And both of these values really are solutions of the original equation we started with. x squared minus 10x equals 23. Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to suggest that you check these numbers using a different tool. Maybe the quadratic formula, for example, which we've already learned about in a previous lesson. But you might want to check those to make sure that they're actually correct. Both of them really are solutions to that original equation. Now, I'd like to transition to a few other examples which demonstrate a few of the other things that can happen when you're completing the square. So, the first one that I'm going to show you answers this question. What happens if the middle term, or the coefficient in front of the x term, happens to be odd? Let's look at this example. Solve the equation x squared plus 5x minus 24 equals 0 using the method of completing the square. Now, notice that that 5 is odd, but that's not a problem. It might make the arithmetic a bit messier, but that shouldn't run us off. We just have to walk through the arithmetic a little more carefully because some fractions are going to come in. So, to determine that amount that we need to add in and subtract out, like we've done before in completing the square, we divide that 5, which is the coefficient in front of the x term, by 2, and that gives us 5 halves. We then square that number and have to add that amount in. 
5 halves squared is the same as 25 divided by 4. So I'm going to have to add in a 25 divided by 4 and then subtract out 25 fourths as well so that everything balances. And when I add that amount in and then subtract it out, here's what I have. I have x squared plus 5x plus 25 fourths. I'm going to group those with a set of parentheses. Then minus 25 fourths minus the 24 that was there in the original equation equals zero. The front part, which is inside the parentheses, is the same as x plus 5 halves whole thing squared. Then I have minus 25 fourths minus 24 equals zero. I want to combine the 25 fourths and the 24, so I need to get a common denominator, which is 4, and that's going to give me x plus 5 halves squared minus 25 fourths minus 96 fourths when I rewrite 24 with a denominator of 4, and that all equals 0 as well. And now let's combine. I have x plus 5 halves squared minus 121 divided by 4 equals 0 when I do the subtraction which is actually just an addition of two negative numbers. And now I'm going to add the 121 divided by 4 to the other side. And I'll have x plus 5 halves squared equals 121 over 4. Now if you remember, I wanted to then take the square root to get rid of the square on the left hand side. Before I do that, I want you to notice that 121 divided by 4 is the same as 11 divided by 2 whole thing squared, because the square root of 121 is 11, and the square root of 4 is 2. And now I see that actually both sides of this equation are perfect squares. So I'm going to take the square root of both sides, and I'm going to have x plus 5 halves equals, plus or minus, 11 halves. Remember, you have to put in that plus or minus anytime you take the square root of both sides of an equation. You're not necessarily guaranteed that both numbers will be a solution, but you have to put in that plus or minus when you take the square root of both sides of that equation. Now you have two possibilities. You either have x plus 5 halves equals plus 11 halves or x plus 5 halves equals negative 11 halves. If you subtract 5 halves from both sides of these equations, you'll have x equals 11 halves minus 5 halves or x equals negative 11 halves minus 5 halves. Now, in the first one, 11 halves minus 5 halves is 6 halves, which is 3. So x equals 3 is one of the solutions. In the second, you have negative 11 halves minus 5 halves, which is the same as negative 16 halves, which is negative 8. And so, actually, our two solutions are really clean. They're just x equals 3 and x equals negative 8. No fractions. They're just good old whole numbers. How in the world did that happen? Well, it turns out that x squared plus 5x minus 24 actually factors. It factors as x minus 3 times x plus 8. Of course, we were told to do this example by completing the square, so we would have never seen the factoring. But I, I wanted to mention this to you because it's a great way to check your answer. Of course, if we hadn't been told to complete the square, it might have been wise for us to start the example by checking to see if factoring was going to work. This is a very important concept I want you to keep using as a student of math. There's often more than one way to solve a mathematical problem. In this case, we did it with completing the square. We could have also done it with factoring. Now, let's consider another completing the square problem with a slightly different twist. Here it is. Solve the equation negative x squared plus 12x equals negative 42. Now, there's a new issue. What's that negative sign in front of the x squared term? We didn't have that before. What do we do? Just quit? Well, no, don't panic. Just multiply both sides of the equation by negative 1. As long as you multiply both sides of the equation by negative 1, everything is still in balance and you can continue with the algebra. So, we started with negative x squared plus 12x equals negative 42. If we multiply both sides by negative 1 and then distribute the negative 1 on the left hand side, you'll have positive x squared minus 12x equals positive 42. And now what you've done is converted the original equation into one that looks an awful lot like 
one of the previous examples. So let's just now proceed like we did in the previous examples. I'm going to leave the 42 on the right hand side of this equation this time because in fact it doesn't have to come over to the left hand side. Let's just leave it on the right hand side uh, for now. If we need to move it later we can. Now what's the amount that we need to add in and subtract out in order to complete the square if we have x squared minus 12x to start with? Well we divide the 12 by 2, that gives us 6. We then square that 6 to get 36. And that means I need to add in a 36 and subtract out a 36. When I do, I'm going to have x squared minus 12x plus 36, I'm going to put that in parentheses, minus 36 to keep everything balanced, equals 42. The x squared minus 12x plus 36 is the same as x minus 6 whole thing squared. Minus 36 equals 42. That's our new equation. Remember, that's the point of doing this, was to get one of the terms to look like a perfect square. And now if I just add the 36 to the right-hand side, I'm going to have x minus 6 squared equals 42 plus 36, or equals 78. And now if I take the square root of both sides of that equation, I'll have x minus 6 equals, plus or minus, square root of 78. Let's split that into two equations. That's the same as x minus 6 equals positive square root of 78 or x minus 6 equals negative square root of 78. And if I just add 6 to both sides of my equations, I'll have x equals 6 plus the square root of 78 or x equals 6 minus the square root of 78. And I'm done. Now, you might say, does that 78 have any perfect squares sitting inside of it so that we can simplify that square root a bit? Well, let's factor the 78 and find out. 78 is even, so it's got a 2 in it. If I factor that out, I'll have 2 times 39. 39 is not even, so it has no 2's, but it's got a 3 in it. And if I factor out that 3, I'll see that 39 is 3 times 13. And that means the factorization of 78 is 2 times 3 times 13. Notice that there aren't any pairs or repeats of those factors inside that factorization. You have 2, you have 3, and you have 13. They're all different. So 78 doesn't have any square factors inside of it. Now, let's look at another twist which feels a bit similar to that negative coefficient in front of the x squared term that we just saw. Here's the example. Solve 3x squared minus 18x minus 21 equals 0. We want to find the values of x which we can plug into that equation to make the equation true. Now, you don't want to start here by dividing the 18 by 2 and going from there. It turns out that this example has a little extra twist that we have to take care of first before we go anywhere else. Now, what we'll have to do is divide through by the 3 that's sitting in front of the x squared term. It's very important that you basically get the x squared term by itself. Or if you want to put it a different way, that you get the coefficient in front of the x squared term to be 1. When I divide through by a 3 on both sides of the equation, I'm going to be left with x squared minus 6x minus 7 equals 0. Of course, 0 divided by 3 is still 0. So the right-hand side is still 0. Fortunately, all the coefficients in the equation we started with were multiples of 3. So we're still working with integers with whole numbers in this new equation. But even if the original coefficients had not been multiples of 3, it wouldn't have been a showstopper for us. We would have had a little bit messier arithmetic later on, but we could have still done the problem exactly as we've done the previous examples. Now we have x squared minus 6x minus 7 equals 0. What do I need to add in in order to make x squared minus 6x a square, a perfect square? I divide the 6 by 2, that gives me 3. I square the 3 and that gives me 9. So I need to add in a 9 and subtract out a 9. When I do that, I'm going to have x squared minus 6x plus 9. I'm going to put those in parentheses again just for the visual effect. And then I'll have minus 9 minus 7. And that's going to give me x minus 3 squared minus basically 16 equals 0. The 16 comes from the 9 and the 7. And if I move that 16 to the right hand side, I'll have x minus 3 whole thing squared 
equals 16. Square rooting both sides, if you will, taking the square root of both sides of that equation gives me x minus 3 equals plus or minus 4. So x minus 3 is 4, or x minus 3 is negative 4, and if I add 3 to both sides of those equations, I'll have x is 7, or x equals negative 1. Now you can check these solutions by simply plugging them into the original equation. You could plug in the 7, and you could plug in the negative 1. I'm going to leave that to you. The arithmetic is pretty straightforward to do it, but because of time, I'm going to go ahead and leave the checking of those solutions to you. Plug in the 7 and plug in the negative 1, and you'll be good to go. Well, we've seen this technique today called completing the square, and we've used it to solve a number of different quadratic equations. It turns out that completing the square also plays a very important role in graphing quadratic functions. And that's going to be the subject of our next lesson. I look forward to talking with you about those graphs in that next lesson. We've seen a wide variety of techniques for solving quadratic equations factoring, completing the square, and the quadratic formula, just to name a few. Those lessons focused on what most people think of when they think about the algebra of quadratic equations. I'd like to turn to a different, more visual way to represent quadratic equations or quadratic functions, and that would be graphing. In the process, we're going to incorporate a number of the previous algebra tools that we've seen, from factoring quadratic expressions to completing the square. Before we look at a number of the examples, I want to share some introductory vocabulary and ideas. So let's do that first. Let's talk some about the terms that surround uh, quadratic expressions. The graph of a quadratic function y equals ax squared plus bx plus c is known as a parabola. Parabolas have been the subject of mathematical study for at least 2,000 years. Well-known thinkers like Euclid, Apollonius, Pappus, and Archimedes studied the properties of the parabola. We're not going to go into all the details of their work in our course, but we are indebted to them for their study. They were very careful in their study of parabolas, and we now understand them much better because of their work. In general, a parabola is a U-shaped graph. Some parabolas are going to open upwards, and they're sometimes referred to then as cup-shaped, like a drinking cup, while others open downwards and are sometimes called caps because of that, like the cap you would put on your head. So for example, the graph of y equals x squared is a cup. In fact, it is a parabola that's going upwards or opening upwards, and it goes right through the origin. The graph of y equals negative 3x squared is a cap. It also goes through the origin, but it's opening downwards, and so we call it a cap-shaped graph. Now you might wonder, what's the deciding factor that makes one of those graphs a cup and the other one a cap? Well, that's a great question, and the answer actually is pretty simple. It's the sign of the coefficient in front of the x squared term, and that's all. So this is an extremely important fact to remember. The orientation of a parabola, or whether it's a cup or a cap, is going to simply depend on the sign of a if your function is y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. So if a, the coefficient in front of x squared, is positive, then the graph is a cup. If a is negative, or less than zero, then the graph is a cap. So the cupness or capness has nothing to do with b or c, the coefficient of the x term or the constant term. It has everything to do with the sign of a, which is the coefficient in front of x squared. So in the earlier examples I just showed you, a was equal to 1 when we talked about y equals x squared. 1 is positive, so we had a cup-shaped parabola. And in the second example, a was negative 3, 
when we were looking at y equals negative 3x squared. Negative 3, of course, is negative, and so the graph opened downward and was a cap. So what else can we say in general about the graphs uh, of these quadratic functions, about these parabolas? Well, there's another bit of vocabulary that I really ought to mention. Notice that there's always either a unique lowest point if you have a cup-shaped parabola, or a unique highest point if you have a cap-shaped parabola. In any case, you're always going to have either a lowest point or a highest point. That point has a special name. It's known as the vertex of the parabola. It's extremely important. So finding the vertex is high priority for us as we walk through the examples in this lesson. We're going to talk more about how we would find that vertex in our examples, but keep in mind completing the square, which we saw in an earlier lesson. That technique, completing the square, is going to help us identify that vertex. Although it's probably obvious, given what I've just said to you, let me make a comment about what I call the end behavior of the graph of a quadratic function. Notice that both ends of the parabola go in the same direction. Either both go up in the cup case, or both go down in the other case, the cap case. This is very different from the graph of a line, where one end goes down and the other goes up. We saw with lines earlier that you might have one end of the line going down and the other one going up, or one end going down on this side and the other one going up. It's important to realize that the graph of a quadratic does nothing more than make this U-shaped graph. It doesn't come down later out of our view. It doesn't make a lot of waves. It's simply going to be a U-shaped graph, either opening upwards or opening downwards. One other comment is appropriate at this point before we get to our examples. With lines, we wanted to know about the intercepts of the graphs of those lines. And here we're going to care about the intercepts as well. There's just going to be one y-intercept, as we had in the case of lines, as long as the line wasn't vertical, of course. But there are going to be many different possibilities for the x-intercepts of a parabola. You might have no x-intercepts. You might have exactly one x-intercept. You might have exactly two different x-intercepts. Now, there are no other possibilities besides those three for the x-intercepts of a parabola because of the shape of that parabola. This is a bit different from the situation with lines, where in the case of lines, you could only have one x-intercept at most. Here, with parabolas, we can have at most two different x-intercepts. Finding these x-intercepts, if they're easy to find, can be done with factoring techniques. And we've talked about those techniques in previous lessons. It's always nice to find the x-intercepts when you're plotting a graph. They give us points to draw in and sort of connect the dots, if you will, as we're drawing the graphs. So as we walk through these examples, we're going to want to see if the x-intercepts are pretty easy to find. So let's start with a straightforward example and then ramp up to more complicated examples of drawing these parabolas. Here's the example I want us to look at for now. Let's sketch the graph of the quadratic y equals x squared minus 4x plus 4. Well, let's say several things. First, does the graph open upwards or does it open downwards? Well, we look at one thing, the coefficient in front of the x squared term. In this case, it's a 1. Now, I know it's not written there, but it's implicitly a 1, and it's a plus 1. Since that's positive, I know that my parabola is going to open upwards or going to be what I'm calling a cup-shaped graph. So the two ends of the graph are both going to go up. Okay, is this polynomial factorable? Can I factor it? In fact, I can. It turns out to be a perfect square because it factors as x minus 2 times x minus 2. Or we could write it more succinctly as just x minus 2 whole thing squared. Now, if I know that factorization, how do I find those x-intercepts? Well, an x-intercept is a point on the x-axis, which means the y-value for the point, the y-coordinate for those points, has to be 0. So I'm going to take my original equation, and I'm going to let y equal 0 and solve for x. And when I do that, I'm going to have 
x squared minus 4x plus 4 equals 0. I'm letting the y value equal 0. And we saw earlier that x squared minus 4x plus 4 is the same as x minus 2 whole thing squared. That means x minus 2 has to equal 0 when I take the square root of both sides of the equation. Now, of course, I should say plus or minus 0, but of course, plus or minus 0 is just 0. So I have the equation x minus 2 equals 0, which is the same as x equals 2. And because we found only one number there, we know that we have only one x-intercept. It's going to happen at x equals 2 and, of course, y equals 0. So at the point 2 comma 0, I'm going to have an x-intercept. Now, let's next talk about our vertex. Remember, the vertex here is going to be the lowest point. Because I know the parabola is opening upwards, I know that the vertex is going to be the lowest point. To find that quickly, I want to rewrite the original equation using completing the square. That was one of the points of showing completing the square to you in our previous lesson. Notice that this equation is already almost written in the form of completion of the square. We already have one side of it written as x minus 2 whole thing squared. That reminds us a bit of completing the square. But we don't see a number dangling off on the end, a constant term, if you will. I can actually write that in by just adding a plus 0. So instead of having y equals x minus 2 squared and nothing else, I could write y equals x minus 2 whole thing squared plus 0. And now the coordinates of the vertex are actually staring right at us. The vertex coordinates are 2 comma 0. But where did they come from? Well, Here's the main rule for writing down or finding the vertex of a parabola. The vertex of the parabola of, that has the equation y equals x minus m squared plus n will have coordinates m comma n. Notice the signs. This is very, very important. The sign in front of the m in the equation needs to be negative so that the x coordinate is actually positive m. The sign in front of the n is positive in the equation so that the sign of the coordinate n is also positive. So there's a slight change in the signs in the equation in order to write down that vertex. But again, the point is, if the equation is of the form y equals x minus m squared plus n, then the coordinates of the vertex are at m comma n. So, we know our vertex is at 2 comma 0 because of the way the equation was written. It was x minus 2 squared plus 0. And that's where the 2 and the 0 came from. But wait a minute. That was also the x-intercept that we found a few moments ago. So what's going on? Well, if you draw the graph quickly, you'll see that the parabola is actually making a cup shape. We already knew that. And it's sitting on the point 2 comma 0 right on the x-axis. So this parabola doesn't go below the x-axis, it actually sits right on it. And that finishes that example. We know that the parabola is, has the vertex at 2 comma 0 and opens upward. Now, let's look at a second example very quickly with some different, um, different characteristics in it. Let's sketch the graph of the equation y equals x squared plus 6x plus 5. Okay. First question that we should always ask when we're drawing one of these parabolas. Cup or cap? Is it going upwards or is it going downwards? The answer is it's opening upwards because the coefficient in front of the x squared is positive 1. Okay, what about the x-intercepts? Well, to find those, let's factor. Let's at least check to see if we can factor. By the way, if the factoring is not nice, then the x-intercepts aren't going to be nice either. Having the x-intercepts actually is not crucial to us, but they really are nice to find. So I like to check to see if I can find them relatively quickly. If I can't, I just move past that onto some other part of the parabola. In this case, though, I can factor x squared plus 6x plus 5 pretty easily. x squared plus 6x plus 5 is the same as x plus 1 times x plus 5. So I actually have y equals x plus 1 times x plus 5. What does that mean for my x-intercepts? Well, again, an x-intercept has the y-coordinate equal to 0, because a point with a y-coordinate equal to 0 won't get off of the x-axis. 
So I'm going to take y equals x plus 1 times x plus 5, and I'm going to replace the y by 0. And I'll have 0 equals x plus 1 times x plus 5. And that means x plus 1 has to equal 0, or x plus 5 has to equal 0. And therefore, x is either equal to negative 1, or x is equal to negative 5. So I actually have two x-intercepts in this problem. One of them happens at negative 1 comma 0, and one of them happens at negative 5 comma 0. So if you're following along with me with a piece of graph paper, and you want to start plotting this, we actually do know two points. They are at negative 1 comma 0 and negative 5 comma 0 on the x-axis. Keep in mind also, this parabola we already determined is going to go up. So it's going to open upwards or make this cup shape. Now, let's stop for a minute and ask a question. We know where the two x-intercepts are. They're both to the left of the origin. And we know it opens upward. I just mentioned that. So here's a question. In which quadrant will the vertex live? Is it going to be in quadrant 1, 2, 3, or 4? The answer is it's going to be down in quadrant 3 because the parabola has these two x-intercepts to the left of the origin, and it's going to open upwards. So it's got to get down below those in order to complete the drawing of the parabola. And that means that that vertex has to live down in quadrant 3. But where is the vertex? Do you remember how we find these vertices, the vertex of each parabola? We complete the square to find the vertex. So let's do that here. We go back to our original equation y equals x squared plus 6x plus 5. And we ask ourselves, what number would I have to add in and then subtract out in order to have this completion of the square, in order to complete the square? I stare at the x squared plus 6x. I take 6 and divide it by 2 to give me 3. And I square the 3 to give me 9. And that means I know I need to add 9 to x squared plus 6x in order to get this perfect square. If I add 9 in, I must subtract 9 out so that everything balances. And that means that my equation is going to be rewritten this way. y equals x squared plus 6x plus 9, then minus 9 plus 5. Minus 9 comes in for the balancing effect, if you will. The plus 5 was there to begin with. We have to keep it. But by keeping the x squared plus 6x plus 9 together, I now know that that's a perfect square. And so my original equation can be rewritten as y equals x plus 3 squared minus 9 plus 5, or y equals x plus 3 squared minus 4. Now that's the same as the equation we started with. I've just rewritten it in a different way. Now, the form of the equation of a parabola that we had before was y equals x minus m squared plus n, and the vertex then had coordinates m comma n. How are our signs working out now? Well, notice that I have x plus 3 squared minus 4. And that means that the coordinates of my vertex are actually at negative 3 comma negative 4. If you think about it for a moment, that's in quadrant 3. So we're on the right track. We said earlier that the vertex would have to be in quadrant 3, and we just found negative 3 comma negative 4 is the vertex, and that's in quadrant 3. Now once I take my graph paper and I plot those two x-intercepts and I plot that vertex, I can sketch the graph pretty quickly because I know what it looks like. The vertex is the lowest point, and then the parabola has to open upwards, go through those two x-intercepts, and I'm done. That would actually give me a perfectly good sketch of my parabola. But before I move past this example, let me make a side comment. Notice that your plot ought to have y-intercept 0, 5. You know, if you just start drawing this thing pretty quickly, you might not really get a very accurate sketch. But really, we ought to check what is the y-intercept. And if we can draw our parabola through the y-intercept, we can be at least a little more accurate. How do we find the y-intercept? Well, a y-intercept of a graph is a point where x equals 0. Think about it. If you're on the y-axis, it means that you couldn't have moved to the left or to the right in the x direction. So to find a y-intercept, we go back to the original equation and we set x equal to 0. Well, y equals x squared plus 6x plus 5. 
with zeros plugged in for the x's is going to give you y equals 0 squared plus 6 times 0 plus 5, and that's just y equals 5. And I hope you see that that arithmetic really is pretty easy with all those zeros thrown in. Once you know y equals 5 is part of that y-intercept, you know that the coordinates are actually 0, 5. So if you draw this parabola going also through the point 0, 5 for your y-intercept, you'll actually have an even more accurate sketch of this parabola. Great. So let's look at another example now. Sketch the graph of y equals negative x squared plus 8x. Now, I want you to notice that this graph is going to be different from the previous examples we've looked at. Notice that the coefficient in front of the x squared is negative 1. And that means that this parabola is going to open downwards. It's going to be cap-shaped, if you will. That's great to remember. We want to always think about what we can as we're drawing these graphs. And in this case, we'll have a downwards opening parabola. Now, the next thing we ought to do is think about the x-intercepts, if we can find them. Well, I need to take my original equation and let y equal 0. So y equals negative x squared plus 8x becomes 0 equals negative x squared plus 8x. And notice that there's an x in common in both terms on that side of the equation. There's an x inside of x squared. There's an x inside of 8x. So I can factor that common term out, and I'll have the equation 0 equals x times negative x plus 8. Well, that means that either the x equals 0 or the negative x plus 8 equals 0. And that's the same as saying x is 0 or x is positive 8. So I actually have two x-intercepts here. They're either going to be at 0, 0 or 8, 0. So one of the x-intercepts is actually the origin, and the other x-intercept is 8 units to its right. Now, where's the vertex? Well, remember, the parabola is cap-shaped this time. We already talked about it, and we know where the two x-intercepts are going to be. So the vertex now must be above the x-axis, and it must be sitting in quadrant 1. That's fine. It's, again, good to be thinking about these as you're completing the drawing so that you don't make a mistake along the way. Now, can we complete the square in the original equation? Well, let me suggest that we do so by rewriting it just a little bit. I'm going to take y equals negative x squared plus 8x, and I'm going to rewrite it as y equals the negative of the quantity x squared minus 8x. Now, just for a moment, look at what's inside the parentheses. You have x squared minus 8x there. What would you need to add to make that part a perfect square? Well, you divide the 8 by 2 and you get 4, and you square 4 and you get 16. So what you should do is add in a 16 to what's inside those parentheses. And what you'll have then is y equals the negative of the quantity x squared minus 8x plus 16, and then plus something else. Remember, when you add in one of these pieces, you have to subtract it out as well. But in fact, what you've done to add in that 16 is actually you've brought in a negative 16. Look at the minus sign that's out in front of that, that set of parentheses. So you've actually already thrown in negative 16 into this equation. If you want to make everything balanced, you need to then add in 16 so that all of the equation balances out. And when you write all that down, you're going to have y equals the negative of x squared minus 8x plus 16 plus 16. And again, that's because the plus 16 inside of the parentheses is actually a negative 16 because of the minus sign out in front. So you always want to keep in mind those negative signs in front of those parentheses. Distributing those is very, very important. Now, can we think about what's inside those parentheses as a perfect square? Of course we can. That quantity is the same as x minus 4 whole thing squared. And so my equation becomes y equals negative x minus 4 squared plus 16. You've actually completed the square there with a negative out in front. It's not the easiest thing to do, but it can be done. And once we've done it, we actually know the coordinates of our vertex. 
If you hide that negative sign that's all the way out in front from your eyes for just a second, what's left tells you that the vertex is at 4, 16. And 4, 16 is in the first quadrant, and that's where it was supposed to be. So that's fabulous. You can now sketch your graph. Remember, your parabola is going to open downwards, and you'll have your parabola drawn. Now, let's quickly look at one last example in this lesson. I want us to sketch the graph of y equals x squared plus 3. Well, the first thing I want you to notice is that this equation has no linear term. It's missing its x to the first term. It's not like we have x squared plus 7x plus 3 or x squared minus 5x plus 3. We're actually missing that middle term in our quadratic. And that's actually a very big hint that you don't want to lose out on. It actually means that the equation we're given is, can be rewritten in the following way to highlight that you don't need to complete the square. You can rewrite it as y equals x minus 0 squared plus 3. Right? x minus 0 is the same as x, so x minus 0 squared plus 3 is the same as x squared plus 3. And that means you know what the vertex is. You see the 0 inside the parentheses and the 3 on the outside, and it means that your vertex is actually located at 0, 3. Now, where is 0, 3? It's actually on the y-axis. 0 in the x direction and 3 in the y means that the vertex is actually sitting on the y-axis, okay? What else do we know about this graph? Well, we know that the coefficient in front of the x squared is a positive 1. And that means, because it's positive, that the graph is going to grow upwards rather than downwards. So, we have a graph that has a vertex at the y, on the y-axis at 0, 3, and it's going to grow or open upwards. And that means that you're going to have a parabola that never crosses the x-axis. So it will have absolutely no x-intercepts. And what's neat about what we've done in this lesson today is we've seen an example of a parabola where you have exactly one x-intercept. Remember the parabola that just sat on the x-axis. We've seen a number of examples where we had two x-intercepts. And here we see an example where the parabola actually has no x-intercepts. And all three of those possibilities are definitely there. Let me make one other comment about the graph we just drew, and then we'll close out our lesson. I want you to notice that the graph of y equals x squared plus 3 is actually just the graph of y equals x squared, where the vertex is at 0, 0, just shifted up the y-axis three units. So we go from y equals x squared, which has a parabola going right through the origin and opening upwards, and we shift that right up the x-axis three units, and we get the graph of y equals x squared plus 3. These ways of transforming the graphs are very, very helpful. And as we get to later lessons, where we're graphing even more complicated functions, we'll see this idea of being able to shift the graph either up or down or left or right can be very, very helpful to us as we draw more complicated graphs based on the graphs of simpler functions. Well, today we've spent this lesson describing the visual aspects of quadratic functions. I hope you've seen a number of ways that these graphs compare and contrast with the graphs of linear equations that we studied several lessons ago. But you might be thinking, who cares? I mean, why would we even want to know about these graphs having this sort of U-shape or cupped shape graph? Well, it turns out that there are lots of real-world uses for objects which are parabolic in shape. Parabola, parabolic. Think about satellite dishes, or look at an old car headlight sometime, or maybe the fl a flashlight. Why are those shaped in a parabolic fashion, or shaped like parabolas. Well, it's because that shape allows for the beams, 
like the light beams that are coming out of the bulb at the end of the headlight, to all be focused or concentrated in one direction. It intensifies the beams. This is very beneficial rather than just having all the light going in all directions in front of your car. You want to have all of those beams going in front of the car so that you can see as you drive at night. That's one of the biggest uses, most important uses, of parabolas and parabolic shapes in the real world. Well, we've talked about these parabolas today. I want you to know that next time, you'll probably want to have a calculator handy as we continue discussion of quadratics in the next lesson. I'll see you then. Like their linear counterparts, quadratic equations often arise in word problems and real-world situations. My biggest goal in this lesson is to demonstrate some of these kinds of problems to you. So let's get right into the examples today. Assume you're building the floor of a rectangular room in large pieces of wood using the following design. The total area of the room is to be 42 square feet. I'd like for us to determine the value of x from the diagram that we need in order to build this floor for the room. And we're going to approximate x accurate to two places after the decimal point. Now, as we've seen in the past, we need to define some variables and think about formulas that we already know which can help us in completing the example. So we can define the length and the width of the room from the diagram, and I'm going to call W the width of the room, and I'm going to let L be the length of the room, and then A is going to be the square footage or the area of the room. Now, from the diagram, I know that the width of the room, or W, is equal to X plus 1, and the length of the room is going to be 2x plus 2. And of course we know that the area of a rectangle is going to be the length times the width, so the area is equal to L times W. Now that means that the area is also then equal to x plus 1 times 2x plus 2, because the width was x plus 1 and the length was 2x plus 2. We also know that the area is 42 square feet. That was actually given to us in the information that was provided in the example. And that means that we have an equation. x plus 1 times 2x plus 2 equals 42. We got that because we knew the area was equal to 42, and we knew the area was equal to x plus 1 times 2x plus 2. So we basically had area given to us in two different forms, and we've set those two different forms equal to one another. We can now solve that equation, x plus 1 times 2x plus 2 equals 42, for the variable x. And that's the goal of the problem. So let's walk right into that and see how we can solve that equation for x. Well, the first thing you might notice is that a 2 can be factored out of the term 2x plus 2. So I would suggest we actually factor that 2 out of the quantity 2x plus 2. When we do that, the equation that we had is the same as 2 times x plus 1 times another x plus 1 equals 42. And now I see that both sides of the equation have a 2 in them. There's obviously a 2 at the beginning of the left-hand side, and 42 has a factor of 2 in it as well. So let's get rid of that 2 on the left-hand side by simply dividing both sides of the equation by 2. When we do that, we're going to have x plus 1 times x plus 1 equals 42 divided by 2, or just 21. So my equation really is x plus 1 quantity squared equals 21. Now, I want you to notice that that looks a bit like one of the steps we ran into when we were handling problems with completing the square. So what do we do at this stage? Well, we take the square root of both sides of our equation. 
and we get x plus 1 on the left equals plus or minus square root of 21 on the right. Don't forget that plus or minus. Remember, when you take the square root of both sides of an equation, you must include that plus or minus. It has to be there. And that means you really have two equations, right? You have x plus 1 equals square root of 21, or x plus 1 equals the negative of the square root of 21. And now you want to get x by itself. So you subtract 1 from both sides of your equations, and you get x equals negative 1 plus the square root 21, or x equals negative 1 minus square root of 21. Those negative ones come from subtracting that 1 from the left-hand side over to the right-hand side. Now, in earlier problems we've looked at, especially those without any sort of real-world significance, we've just moved on from here to our next problem when we've said we have two solutions and we've been done. But now we really do need to think a bit. That's one of the things we always have to remember when we're dealing with word problems or real-world problems. We have to ask ourselves whether the solutions make any sense at all. So, first off, let's use a calculator and approximate the square root of 21. If you punch in square root of 21 into your calculator, you're going to find that it's about the same as 4.58. So that means that your two solutions, x equals negative 1 plus square root of 21, or x equals negative 1 minus square root of 21, are approximately going to be x equals negative 1 plus 4.58 or negative 1 minus 4.58. And that means that your two values of x are close to 3.58 or negative 5.58. And those come from doing the arithmetic that we already had. Now, do both of these answers make sense as values of x? The answer is no way. Remember that x is the length of one of these pieces of our floor. So how in the world could we let x be approximately negative 5.58 feet? In the context of this word problem, we have to throw out x equals negative 5.58. And that means that it leaves us with only one possible answer for x. x is approximately equal to 3.58 feet. Now, let's look at a similar kind of problem just to try to nail down some of the ideas here. So here's the example. We're going to build a small rectangular box. Actually, it's already been built, and it has a volume of 280 cubic centimeters. The dimensions of the box are 4 centimeters by x centimeters by x plus 3 centimeters. I want us to find the value of x so that this box actually does have volume 280 cubic centimeters. You can think of this as the length of one side of the box. Remember, one of the dimensions was x centimeters. Now, I often find when I get these kinds of word problems that a sketch uh, or a picture that's related to the problem can be very helpful before I ever try to do any mathematics. So, the, the sketch doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be a piece of artwork. It just needs to get the general idea of the problem across. So I need it to be drawn sort of like a box, a rectangular box. I don't want it looking like a sphere or a cylinder or a cone or something like that. It would help if it looks somewhat three-dimensional rather than just a flat square on the paper. But beyond that, I don't need the graph or the drawing. It's not really a graph. I don't need the diagram or the drawing to be all that good. So don't sit down and try to get too picky about this drawing. Just make a sketch that you can label and understand what the problem's doing. Once you have that drawing on the page, you should label it as much as you can based on the information that was given to you in the example. So in this case, I would draw some sort of rectangular box and I would then label the sides. I was told that one side had length 4 centimeters, another side had length x centimeters, and another side had length x plus 3 centimeters. And these were the three lengths or dimensions that were given in the problem. So once I've got that done, I'm in great shape. Now what do I do? Well, 
I was also told that the volume of this box is 280 cubic centimeters. And that's a hint that if I need a formula for the volume of a box in general. So we should stop for a moment and ask ourselves, do we know the volume of a rectangular box or a rectangular solid? Well, it turns out that there is a, vo a volume formula if you're working with a rectangular box, and it is volume is length times width times height, where you might call the length L and the width W and the height H. So if you want to make it look more like an algebraic equation, it would just be V equals L times W times H. Kind of reminds you a bit of the area formula for a rectangle, where the area formula is length times width. Now with volume, we then multiply again, in this case, by the height. So you have length times width times the height. And those three pieces multiplied together give you volume. So from there, let's go back to our diagram. We know that the volume is length times width times height. What is that in this particular problem? Well, it tells us that V must be 4 times X times X plus 3. Because the 4, the X, and the X plus 3 are acting like the length, the width, and the height. Now you might say, well, how did you know which one was which? The answer is, I don't need to know whether the 4 is the length, the width, or the height. I don't need to know if the X is acting like the length, the width, or the height, or the X plus 3. All I need to know is that if I multiply those three quantities together, I will have length times width times height. And so I have the equation V equals 4 times X times X plus 3. But remember, we were also told in the problem that the volume is 280. So I now know two different quantities which are equal to V. One of them is 4 times X times X plus 3. That was the first amount that was given to us for V. And the other one was 280. Those two have to be equal because they're both the volume. So I have the equation 4X times X plus 3 equals 280. The problem said that they wanted a value for X. I wanted to solve this equation for X. So let's now start solving this equation for X. By the way, notice, this is going to be a quadratic equation. I don't see any x squareds in there, but if I just multiplied the x that's on the outside of the parentheses with the x that's on the inside of the parentheses, I'll have an x squared. So this really is a quadratic equation. It's just that it's a little bit hidden right now. So we're solving this quadratic equation for x. I would suggest that we start by getting rid of the 4 that's on the left-hand side. And how can we do that legally? Well, if you divide both sides of the equation by 4, you'll have just x times x plus 3 on the left, because the 4's will cancel. And on the right, you'll have 280 divided by 4. And of course, that's 70. So we've now whittled our equation down just a little bit. And we now have x times x plus 3 equals 70. Now, I want to solve this equation for x. That's exactly what I was told to do. What do I do next? Well, uh, I, might ex I might suggest that we expand the left-hand side and move the 70 over to the left-hand side and see what we have. If you expand the left-hand side or multiply it out, you'll have x squared plus 3x. And of course, that's equal to 70. If I subtract 70 from both sides of that equation, I will then have x squared plus 3x minus 70 equals 0. Now that equation is clearly quadratic and it is waiting for us to solve it. And you've seen a lot of ways to solve such a quadratic equation. You could use the quadratic formula. You could complete the square. You could try to factor. There are lots of ways to attack this problem. I have to be honest with you, I'm not all that excited about completing the square here. Can you imagine why? Well, because the coefficient in front of the x term is odd. It's a 3. And if you do completing the square here, you're going to introduce some fractions which are going to slow us down. Don't get me wrong, there's nothing bad about fractions, but admittedly the arithmetic gets a bit more involved when the fractions show up compared to whole numbers. So if you don't mind, for now I'm going to put completing the square aside as an alternate uh, way of doing this problem. But let's try something else. I'm going to suggest we think about factoring. Now, 
you might think, oh, with that 70 in there, I really don't want to try factoring here. I actually wouldn't uh, be that worried here because, think about this, 70 is equal to 10 times 7. That's probably one of the first ways you would think about writing 70 when you're factoring it, 10 times 7. Notice that 10 and 7 are only 3 away from one another. And notice the coefficient in front of the x term is 3. That's a huge hint that the quadratic polynomial that you have on the left-hand side of your equation really does factor. x squared plus 3x minus 70 factors as x plus 10 times x minus 7. Notice I used the 10 and the 7, multiplied them together to give me 70. That's part of the L part of FOIL, if you remember how we've done that in the past. And then plus 10x minus 7x is going to give me plus 3x, the middle term of my polynomial. So this really works. This is the factorization, x plus 10 times x minus 7, and that all equals 0. Now, once you have that factorization, you know that this equation becomes two equations, x plus 10 equals 0 or x minus 7 equals 0. And those two translate to x equals negative 10 or x equals positive 7. Now, here's the question. You always have to ask this with these real world problems. Which of the two answers is correct? They might both be correct. Uh, neither one might be correct, or exactly one might be correct. Well, in this problem, x is one of the dimensions of the box. Can you have a negative length or a negative dimension on a box? Of course not. So x equals negative 10 is definitely not the correct answer in this problem. And that means that the answer must be x equals 7 centimeters. Now, I'd like to suggest that we check that really, really quickly by going back to the equation we had and plugging in x equals 7. So let's do that quickly. We had the equation v equals 4x times x plus 3. We think x equals 7 is our correct solution. Let's plug in x equals 7 and see what we get. v equals 4 times 7 times 7 plus 3. Now let's multiply that out. 4 times 7 is 28. The 7 plus 3 is going to give me 10. So I'll have 28 times 10, which is 280. That was the value we were supposed to have for the volume, which means x equals 7 centimeters really is the correct answer here. So what I'd like to do then is move on to another example where we see how to use a quadratic equation to solve a pretty real world kind of problem. Suppose that you have a can of a certain brand of paint and it'll cover exactly 600 square feet of area. Doesn't matter what kind of uh, object you're painting or what surface you're painting on, but in this case, the can will cover exactly 600 square feet of area. I want us to determine the radius of the largest circle that we can paint with three such cans of paint. So, the first thing we should do is define some variables and think about what the problem's asking. So I'm going to imagine that I have a circle that I'm trying to paint as big as I can. I'm going to mark the radius of that circle as R, and I'm going to let the area of that circle be A. Then I know a formula for the area of this circle. The area A equals pi R squared, pi R squared. Now, for practical purposes, let's just approximate pi by 3.14. It's very important that you know that pi is not exactly equal to 3.14, but it's a decent approximation. And so I'm going to stick with using 3.14 for pi in this problem. Again, pi is not exactly 3.14, but it's close enough for our purposes here. So we basically then have the equation a equals 3.14 times r squared. Now, do we know what A is supposed to be in this problem? Let's go back to the wording of the question. Well, one can of paint was going to cover 600 square feet, so three cans of paint is going to cover three times 600, or 1,800 square feet of area. That means I can replace the value of A by 1,800 in my formula, and that's going to give me 1,800 equals 3.14 R squared. Now we only have one variable in our equation. That variable is R. 
And that value of r, remember r was radius, is exactly what the question asked us to find. So let's solve this equation for r. Notice that the equation is quadratic because we have r squared here. So this really is solving a quadratic equation. The first thing you might consider doing is dividing both sides of the equation by 3.14 to isolate the r squared, to get the r squared by itself on the right-hand side. I think that's actually the right idea, but you might want to use your calculator at this point to actually perform the division. Uh, you can do it by hand, and I certainly like the idea of you doing it by hand, but if you want to go through and just get a quick approximation, let's use our calculator and take 1800 divided by 3.14. If you use your calculator, you'll see that dividing 1800 by 3.14 is going to give you the equation 573.2484 equals r squared. Now, how do you get r? Well, you take the square root of both sides, as we've done in several examples in a number of the previous lessons. If you do that with your calculator, you're going to find that r is plus or minus 23.9426. Remember, when you take the square root of both sides of an equation, you have to include the plus or minus. But of course, as soon as I say that, I should remind myself that the r here is the radius of a circle, and a radius has to be positive. So I know the answer here must be r equals positive 23.9426 feet. So I can paint a circle that has a radius of almost 24 feet uh, and cover it with these three cans of paint. Now, let's look at another example and again try to understand where those real world issues come in as we think about this problem. Let's say that we have a toy rocket and we fire it from ground level straight upwards, so we fire it vertically into the air. The height of the rocket in feet after it's flown for t seconds is given by the formula h equals negative 16 t squared plus 192 t. I want us to determine the time when the rocket reaches its highest point in the air, and I want to determine the maximum height that it reaches in feet. So I want to know when it reaches its highest point and how high it gets. Let's start the problem by seeing if we can rewrite the expression for h, the function for h, in an alternate way so that certain facts about h become more apparent. Notice that when you write h as negative 16 t squared plus 192 t, you can actually factor out a negative 16 and you get h equals negative 16 times the quantity t squared minus 12t. Now you might say to me, wait a minute, I would have never seen a 16 coming out of 192. That's fine, but I bet you could have seen that you could have factored a 2 out from both 16 and 192, and then you probably would have seen you could keep factoring out 2's until you finally end up having a 16 out in front. I also want the negative to come out in front so that I have a positive t squared on the inside of my parentheses. You might even know why I'm doing that. Completing the square might be a good hint, but for now, just factor out that negative 16. Notice that you also have a t inside both t squared and 12t. So a t could be factored out as well. And you would have h equals negative 16t times t minus 12. Now, what do I know from that way of writing my equation? Well, I know that when time t is zero, then the height is also zero. When you plug in t equals zero, you'll get zero back. Also, when you plug in t equals 12, the height will be zero, because you'll have 12 minus 12 as part of the right-hand side. Of course, that's zero. Multiplying the rest of the equation by zero just gives you zero. So it turns out that you know two points on the graph if you were to plot the graph with t in the x direction, if you will, or the horizontal axis, and h as the vertical axis. You'll have two t-intercepts, or what would be x-intercepts if we were using that variable. One of them would be at 0, 0, and the other one would be at 12, 0. Turns out there's a certain symmetry about this graph, and it's best seen if you plot it quickly, and remember, it's going to be a parabola. So it's going to go up, and then it's going to come back down. You should notice that the highest point is exactly the halfway point in the middle of the graph, and that's going to happen when t is 6. 
we could use the language that we had in our previous lessons and point out that the highest point of the parabola is happening at the vertex. So we could have written down the formula in a slightly different way to find that vertex. But here, the highest point happens halfway between t equals 0 and t equals 12. It happens at t equals 6. So it turns out then that we know that t equals 6 is the time when the rocket is actually going to reach its highest point. And it's going to then be straightforward to determine the maximum height of the rocket if we just substitute t equals 6 into the formula h equals negative 16t squared plus 192t. By the way, let's not rush too quickly here. One of the parts of the problem was to find out the time when the rocket reached its highest point. We now have done that. We know that t equals 6 is the time when the rocket reaches its highest point. Now I take that t equals 6 and I plug it back into the formula for h, and when I do so, I'm going to be able to find its highest point at t equals 6. So I'll have my maximum height there as well. So let's do that. I know that my formula for h originally was h equals negative 16t squared plus 192t. I plug in t equals 6 and I get h equals negative 16 times 6 squared plus 192 times 6. 6 squared, of course, is 36, so I have h equals negative 16 times 36 plus 1,152, which comes from multiplying 192 times 6. Doing a little more simplification, I have h equals negative 576 plus 1152. And when I do that last set of combining, I'll have h equals 576 feet. Notice that this makes sense based on the coordinates of the vertex of that parabola. It appears that the y value of that vertex is somewhere between 500 and 600 if you just look at a graph of this parabola, if you had already graphed it. And we just found that that vertex must have a height of 576. So this rocket doesn't get any higher than 576 feet. Of course, we could talk about this in a lot of other ways and make sure that it makes sense what we've just done. So let me make a few comments along those lines. One interesting follow-up question is, what if the rocket had not been fired initially from ground level? Let's say it had been, had been fired from a platform that was 10 feet off the ground. What kind of assumptions did we make as we just solved the earlier example, which would no longer work here? Well, one of the assumptions we made was that we had this sort of symmetry of the graph, that we had the two values that were on the t-axis, or on the x-axis, if you will, and we had a certain symmetry about the graph then. If one of the points now starts up here, if the rocket starts 10 or 20 or 50 feet off the ground, you no longer have that symmetry. So finding that vertex would have been a little more difficult. We would have really had to use the completing the square technique in order to find that vertex. So that's one thing about the original problem that we assumed that would be lost if we started the rocket off the ground on a platform, off the top of a building, something like that. So I'd like to consider now one uh, more example where a quadratic equation comes into play, and let's do it right here at the end of the lesson. So a man is climbing a tree, let's say, and he's 24 feet above the ground when his keys accidentally fall out of his pocket. The function that tells us the height of his keys in terms of time is h of t equals negative 16 t squared plus 24. So that is telling us how high his keys are after they've come out of his pocket t seconds later. I want us to graph h as a function of t and determine how long his keys are actually in the air from the time they leave his pocket to the time they hit the ground. Okay, so let's make several comments before we really jump into the problem. First of all, what are the appropriate values of t in this problem? I talked about the domain of a function in an earlier lesson. And now what I'm asking is, what is the domain of h of t here? What are the appropriate values to plug in for t? Well, t equals negative 10 seconds doesn't make sense. t equals negative 5 seconds doesn't make sense. No negative values are going to make sense for t. 
the smallest valid amount for t is going to be t equals zero. And that's exactly the time when the keys leave his pocket. Okay? So we're only going to look at values t greater than or equal to zero. Secondly, in order to know how long the keys are in the air, we should ask ourselves what the value of h is when the keys are no longer in the air. And the answer is, when they're on the ground, h equals zero feet. So we're not going to let h be negative in any of these uh, discussions. We only want h to be either zero feet when the keys are on the ground, or of course positive when the keys are still in the air. Now, what does a sketch of h look like? Well, h equals negative 16 t squared plus 24. The coefficient of t squared is negative, so my graph is going to be a parabola that's opening downward, or cap-shaped. What else can we say? Well, we know the y-intercept has to be 24, because when t equals 0, h is going to equal negative 16 times 0 squared plus 24, and that's, of course, 0 plus 24, which is 24. So I can actually plot this graph at least that one point. I can plot my h-intercept or y-intercept, and I then know that if we think about it for a minute, the keys will be at their highest point when the man drops them. They're just going to keep going down from there. So that point must serve as the vertex of my parabola. Remember, we're not looking at negative values of t, so I'm not going to look at the full cup shape here. We still know, though, that 0, 24 would serve as the vertex if we were looking at the full graph. So I'm only going to be looking at part of the graph, the part where t is greater than or equal to 0. Actually, I don't even want all of the part where t is greater than or equal to 0. I only want the part where h is also greater than or equal to 0. And the h is acting like the y values, if you will. So we only want that piece in quadrant 1 of the graph. So that's what the graph would look like. That takes care of part A. How about part B? Well, we know h is negative 16 t squared plus 24. At the time the keys hit the ground, h is 0. So what we really have is 0 equals negative 16 t squared plus 24. And we want to solve that for t. If we swing the 16 t squared to the other side, we'll have 16 t squared equals 24. Dividing by 16 gives us t squared is 3 halves. At that point, t is going to equal the square root of 3 halves. And that's the same as square root of 1.5. If I get out a calculator very, very quickly, I can calculate that t then is 1.225 seconds, approximately. Well, we've seen some real-world examples today using quadratic expressions. And next time, we'll continue on as we discuss the Pythagorean theorem. As we start today's lesson, which is all about the Pythagorean theorem, I'd like to make sure we're on the same page with some terminology related to right triangles. So let's talk about some of this vocabulary before we go anywhere. First, a right triangle is a triangle where one of the angles is a right angle, or a 90-degree angle. We often show these right angles when we've drawn the triangle, by placing a small L shape or a small square in the corner of the triangle where the 90 degree angle is located. So that's a right triangle. We're going to talk all about right triangles today. And the next thing we need to know about the right triangle is the names of the edges or the legs, if you will. The side of the triangle which is opposite the right angle is called the hypotenuse. I want you to notice that the hypotenuse is always the longest leg of the three legs of a right triangle. And we're going to use that fact later on just to make sure we're getting the right answers or thinking critically about whether our answers are correct. Now, we normally don't think of the hypotenuse as the longest leg so much, but I want to think of it most of the time as the leg that's across from the right angle. Okay? So, let's move forward. The other two legs are simply going to be called legs of the triangle. 
and they will be shorter than, each one will be shorter than the hypotenuse. Those two legs are actually going to be the legs that make the right angle. So we're gonna have the hypotenuse, which is across from the right angle, and then we'll have the other two legs, which will be the sides that make or create the right angle. It's often the case that the lengths of these three sides of a right triangle are going to be labeled A, B, and C. And normally what's going to happen is C is going to be the letter that we reserve for the length of the hypotenuse, and then A and B will be the lengths of the other two legs. Now, with that notation and terminology in mind, we can now actually state what's called the Pythagorean theorem. Now, Pythagorean theorem is a big phrase, and it probably scares some of you just to hear that phrase. I'll explain exactly what it means in just a second. But here's the statement of the Pythagorean theorem. If you have a right triangle, and you've labeled the leg lengths A, B, and C, as we talked about a few moments ago, then the sum of the squares of the lengths of the legs equals the square of the length of the hypotenuse. Now try saying that five times fast. That's a long thing to say. But I can say it easier with some algebra. With the notation I just mentioned, the Pythagorean theorem simply says that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Now, what does Pythagorean theorem actually mean? Let me just break that down for you quickly. The Pythagorean part is named for the Greek philosopher and mathematician Pythagoras who was actually a leader of a mathematically-based religious sect. It's not known exactly when the Pythagorean theorem was first discovered or proved, but we believe that Pythagoras was teaching in the mid-500s BC. So the Pythagorean theorem is probably about 2,500 years old. Now, that explains the Pythagorean part of the phrase Pythagorean theorem. What's a theorem? Let's just basically mention that quickly. A theorem in mathematics is a proven fact. So it's a fancy way of simply saying a proven fact that was known or proven by Pythagoras. So that's the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared, where A and B are the two shorter lengths of a right triangle, and C is the length of the hypotenuse. Now, I want you to notice before we start doing any problems together that the Pythagorean theorem is actually a quadratic equation because the A is raised to the second power and so is the B and so is the C. So that's why we're talking about this material in this lesson. We've spent several lessons talking about quadratic equations, quadratic polynomials and so on. And now I thought it would be nice to take a lesson where we talk about quadratics in a very, very well-known context. I'm guessing that many of you have heard the phrase Pythagorean theorem before. And what I'd like to do today is look at it as a quadratic equation and study these equations with many different examples and then use the algebra that we've learned to solve some of those problems. So let's now use the information that we know about these right triangles and the Pythagorean theorem to solve a few mathematical problems. Let's start with this example. Assume that the two legs, the shorter legs of a right triangle, have lengths six inches and eight inches respectively. The question is, how long is the hypotenuse? So let's begin by saying that A equals six and B equals eight. I want you to think, A could have been eight and B could have been six. And for some of us, that might paralyze us. How did you know to make A six and B equal to eight? Why didn't you do it the other way around? Well, it wouldn't matter in this problem. The final outcome actually would not be changed if you switched A and B in this case. So let's just make A equal to six and B equal to eight. Now I wanna use the Pythagorean theorem because I have a right triangle. And remember, the Pythagorean theorem says A squared plus B squared equals C squared. If I substitute A equals six, and b equals eight into that equation, I'll have six squared plus eight squared equals c squared. And now I can start doing some simplification. Remember, 
we learned many lessons ago that we need to do our exponentiation first before we do the addition. That was an order of operations thing that we talked about before. So let's do the exponentiations. 6 squared equals 36, and 8 squared equals 64. So if I take the 36 and add it to 64, I'll have 100. And my equation becomes c squared equals 100. And again, I can't emphasize enough, that is a quadratic equation. Now, it has the variable c instead of the variable x, but bottom line, it's a quadratic equation with c as its variable. Not only that, but this problem asked us to find the length of the hypotenuse, and that's c. So I now have this equation, c squared equals 100. If I can just solve that for c, I'll have the answer to my problem. So c squared equals 100. We've seen in previous lessons how to finish off that kind of an equation. We simply take the square root of both sides, and we're left with c equals plus or minus 10. Don't forget that plus or minus. We need to throw it in. Of course, in this problem, c has got to be positive. Why? Because c is measuring the length of the hypotenuse of this triangle, and it doesn't make any sense at all, then, for c to be negative. How in the world could we have negative 10 inches for a length of a hypotenuse? And therefore, I know that my final answer is c equals 10 inches. So, if one of the legs is 6 inches long and the other leg is 8 inches long in a right triangle, then the hypotenuse is going to be 10 inches long. Now, let's move on to a second example, again, using the Pythagorean theorem, just so we get comfortable with this quadratic equation. Assume we have a right triangle again, where the length of the hypotenuse is given to us now as 26, and the length of the shorter leg is 10. Find the length of that longer leg. Now remember, it's longer than the shorter leg, but it has to be smaller than the hypotenuse. So let's use the notation we've been using up to now. A is going to be 10, and C is going to be 26, because it's the length of the hypotenuse. And that means we want to find B. So let's take the Pythagorean theorem, and let's plug in the information that we have, and let's do the simplification and see what we get. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. That's the Pythagorean theorem. If A is 10 and C is 26, then we're going to have 10 squared plus B squared equals 26 squared. That's the same as saying 100 plus B squared equals 676. 26 times 26 is 676. And by the way, I would encourage you to actually do that multiplication on paper. 26 times 26 is very doable. And here you would have 676. If you then subtract 100 from both sides of that equation, the 100 on the left-hand side will cancel, and you'll be left with b squared on the left equals 676 minus 100, or 576 on the right-hand side. That means b squared equals 576. We want to find b, so we now take the square root of both sides of that equation, and we know that b must be either plus or minus square root of 576. Again, the b being a negative number makes no sense at all, and so we're going to say that b must equal square root of 576, because b is the length of one of the legs. It has to be positive. Now, we could stop here and say that b equals the square root of 576 is our final answer. I would suggest, though, that we should check whether there's some simplification that can be done with square root of 576. Now, how would we do that? I mean, I don't have all of the squares memorized. How would I know whether square root of 576 is going to be simpler or not? Well, one idea would be to factor 576 and see if there are any perfect squares hiding inside of it. So let's do that factorization. 576 definitely has a 2 in it because it's even. So I could factor a 2 out. I could do that by long division if I wanted, and I would have 576 equals 2 times 288. 288 is also even, so it must have a 2 in it. So I could factor a 2 out of 288, and I'll be left with 144, along with the two twos that I've now factored out. So 576 must equal 2 times 2 times 144. 
Now, 144, I recognize as a perfect square. It's actually equal to 12 times 12. So I'm not going to factor it down any farther than that, other than to say that 576 is also the same as 2 times 2 times the 12 times the 12. Now, I can put one of the 2s with one of the 12s, and I can put the other 2 with the other 12, and I then know that 576 is 24 times 24, or 24 squared. And now look, I can see that 576 is actually a perfect square. It turns out that it's 24 times 24. And therefore, the square root of 576 is the square root of 24 squared. Well, what's the square root of 24 squared? It's 24. That's sort of the definition of the square root. It undoes the squaring, and so square root of 24 squared is 24. And that's B. And therefore, the length of the longer leg here is 24. Now, before we move on, we should check our answer a little bit with this understanding that the two legs that make up the right angle need to each be smaller than the length of the hypotenuse. Notice that 24 is less than 26. Do you remember that 26 was given to us as the length of the hypotenuse in this problem? And therefore, this leg having a length of 24 actually makes good sense because 24 is less than 26. Now, let's move to a word problem that involves the Pythagorean theorem, although it might not be so obvious at first that it actually does involve the Pythagorean theorem. Here's the word problem. You take a helicopter that's hovering 500 feet directly above its landing pad. That helicopter then flies horizontally 2,000 feet to the north. The question is, what is the straight line distance between the helicopter and the landing pad at the time that the helicopter has made that 2,000 foot distance? I want us to estimate the length to the nearest foot. Now, when I see a word problem like this, I always try to draw a quick sketch of the situation and label it as best I can, just to get a visual picture of what's going on. As I've said to you before, the sketch does not have to be perfect. Just scribble something out and see what happens. Well, one sketch I would draw would have a little landing pad at the bottom and a vertical line going up to demonstrate the length of the distance for the helicopter to be hovering above that pad and then I would draw a horizontal line segment for that 2,000 feet. And now the question is, what is the straight line distance in the problem? Well, what you've done is started building a right triangle. And so now if you just connect it with a little hypotenuse, actually kind of a long hypotenuse, you'll actually have a right triangle. The vertical leg, the horizontal leg, and the hypotenuse. And it turns out that this question is really just asking you for the length of the hypotenuse, where the vertical leg is 500 feet long and the horizontal leg is 2,000 feet long. So really the problem was just about the Pythagorean theorem and finding the length of a hypotenuse. So let's plug in the numbers now to see if we can come up with this straight line distance from the landing pad up to the helicopter. We start with the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, and we plug in a equals 500 and b equals 2,000. Now the numbers are going to get big here, but let's not worry about that for now. Let's just work through the problem and see what we get. We're going to have 500 squared plus 2,000 squared equals c squared, and that's the same as 250,000 plus 4 million equals c squared. I told you these numbers are going to get kind of big, and that means that c squared is 4,250,000. How do I get C by itself? Remember, I want to get the hypotenuse here, the length of the hypotenuse, and that's C. Well, I take the square root of both sides. And I know then that C is square root of 4,250,000. Now, that's not going to be fun to figure out. And in fact, you might just stop here and pull out a calculator and punch in square root of 4,250,000 and be done. But I'd actually like us to work a little farther than that before we jump to the calculator. First of all, I want you to notice that I can factor 
this large number, 4,250,000, as 425 times 10,000. And that's the same as 425 times 100 times 100, or 425 times 100 squared. Notice that square, the 100 squared that's hiding inside, it's going to help us simplify the square root because now I know that the square root of 4,250,000 is the same as square root of 425 times the square root of 100 squared, and the square root of 100 squared is just 100. So that this large number that represents the length of the hypotenuse is the same as 100 times square root of 425. Now, unfortunately, square root of 425 isn't really that friendly, I have to admit. And so we should get a calculator out to estimate that length. Let's go ahead and do so. Square root of 425 is about 20.62. So the length of my hypotenuse then, remember that's C, is approximately equal to the 100 times square root of 425 or 100 times 20.62. And if you multiply 100 times 20.62, you'll have 2,062 feet. Now, I'm claiming that's my hypotenuse length. Before we end the example, we should really ask ourselves, does that answer make sense again? Well, one thing I can say is that 2,062 is larger than the length of each of the other two legs. Notice that the length of those legs was 500 and 2,000. So at least we've got a good feeling that the hypotenuse is correct because 2,062 is larger than 2,000. Now, I'd like to transition a bit to some problems related to the Pythagorean theorem where there's a little more algebra. Notice I really haven't done a whole lot with any variables yet in the lesson, and so what I'd like to do is talk a bit about some problems that really involve some algebra with some variables floating around. So before I do that, let me define a quick phrase. And that phrase is the phrase Pythagorean triple. So here's the definition. A Pythagorean triple is a set of three numbers, A, B, and C, such that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. In other words, the Pythagorean triple only worries about these three whole numbers, A, B, and C. I don't necessarily need the triangle to talk about a Pythagorean triple. So for example, 3, 4, 5 is a Pythagorean triple because 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. And 5, 12, 13 is also a Pythagorean triple because 5 squared plus 12 squared really equals 13 squared. I want you to notice that in both cases, the length of the hypotenuse is exactly one more than the length of one of the legs in the two examples I just gave you. 3, 4, 5, and 5, 12, 13. One question that you might ask is, does that always have to happen? Does one of the legs have to be exactly one less than the length of the hypotenuse? Well, of course not. But there are lots of Pythagorean triples that don't have that property. For example, you can check that if you take 12 squared plus 35 squared, you actually get 37 squared. So 12, 35, 37 is a Pythagorean triple. But notice that you don't have the hypotenuse being exactly one away from one of the legs. In fact, no two of the three numbers are exactly one away from another, 12, 35, and 37. So, this brings up a whole bunch of questions about Pythagorean triples, but let me ask this one question to get us going with some algebra. Does there exist a right triangle where the length of the hypotenuse is 29 and the two leg lengths are only one apart? Is there a right triangle where the hypotenuse is 29 units long and the two leg lengths are only one apart? Well, that's a great question, but how would you get started with that kind of a word problem? Well, let's start by defining some variables and seeing if we can build an equation that we can work with. So, just to get started, let's let A be the length of the shorter leg, the shorter leg of my triangle, and B be the length of the longer leg of the right triangle. We know that the length of the hypotenuse is 29, okay? Now I can use the Pythagorean theorem. 
I know that a squared plus b squared must be 29 squared, thanks to the Pythagorean theorem. But do I know anything else from the problem? Well, in fact, I do. From the problem, I know that I want the two leg lengths to only be one apart from one another. And if I let b be the leg length that's slightly larger than a, then I know that b has to equal a plus 1. If b is going to be one unit longer than a, then b must equal a plus 1. And therefore, I can go back to my equation, which said that a squared plus b squared had to equal 29 squared, and replace b by a plus 1. Just doing a quick substitution. And what does that give me? It gives me a squared plus a plus 1 squared equals 29 squared. Now, what I'm telling you is we have one equation now which only has one variable in it, and that's the letter a. So if I can now solve that equation for a, I'll be set. Let's expand the a plus 1 squared first and then simplify the left-hand side. a plus 1 squared is the same as a plus 1 times a plus 1. And we can FOIL that, and it'll give us a squared plus a plus a plus 1, or a squared plus 2a plus 1. And now I can put that in, a squared plus 2a plus 1, I can put that in for a plus 1 quantity squared. And my equation will become a squared plus a squared plus 2a plus 1 equals 29 squared. Now let's start simplifying that left-hand side. I see an a squared and another a squared. They can be added together, and I'll get 2a squared plus 2a plus 1 equals 29 squared. 29 squared is 841. So I have 2a squared plus 2a plus 1 equals 841. Subtract 841 from both sides, and I'll have 2a squared plus 2a minus 840 equals 0. I want you to notice that the coefficients on the left-hand side are all even, which means I could factor out a 2 and then divide that 2 out on both sides. And when I do that, I'll have a squared plus a minus 420 equals 0. Where did 420 come from? 840 divided by 2. And now what I want you to notice is this is a quadratic equation. I've got the a squared there, and so I know how to solve this thing. I could use factoring, I could use completing the square, I could use the quadratic formula. I don't know which technique you might choose, but I would actually choose to try some factoring first. Completing the square is probably going to get messy because of the 1 that's in front of the a. If I could factor, I'd be really, really happy. So the question I must ask myself is, is there a nice way to think about 420 as the product of two different numbers. And it turns out that 420 really can be multiplied, well, it can be found as the product of two numbers to make this problem simple. Notice that 420 equals 21 times 20. And 21 times 20 is really special here because 21 and 20 are only one apart, and one is the coefficient of the a term. That means the factoring probably will work. And if you write down a plus 21 times a minus 20 and FOIL that out, you really get what you want. The factorization of a squared plus a minus 420 really is a plus 21 times a minus 20. Now, before we go anywhere, you might say, oh, I would never have been able to find that. Fine. Try something else then, like the quadratic formula or uh, maybe even completing the square if you'd like, you will find the same answers that I'm about to find due to this factoring. So let's move forward. I now know that the left-hand side is a plus 21 times a minus 20. That has to equal 0. And that means that a plus 21 is 0, or a minus 20 is 0. And what does that give me? That gives me a equals negative 21, or a equals positive 20. Now, I've said it many times in this lesson. Which of these is the right answer? Well, the right answer cannot be negative because A stands for the length of one of these legs. So A definitely cannot be negative 21. A has to equal 20, the positive of the two numbers. So A equals 20 
is our answer. Now, we've done a lot of work in this example, so I really think we should check this example very, very carefully. So let's think through what we've just done. A has to equal 20. That is the length of the shorter leg. What must the length of the other leg then be? It has to be 21 because we wanted the leg length B to be exactly one more than A. So what I'm now claiming is that we must have a right triangle where the shortest leg has length 20, the next largest leg has length 21, and the hypotenuse has length 29. I think we should check this very quickly by actually plugging them into the Pythagorean theorem and seeing if all these numbers make sense. So let's do the plug-in. By the Pythagorean theorem, we should have 20 squared plus 21 squared equals 29 squared. Now let's multiply all those out. 20 squared is 400. That one's pretty straightforward. 21 squared is 21 times 21, which is 441. And the 29 squared we saw earlier, I believe, is 841. If you hadn't had that written down somewhere, write it out longhand. 29 times 29, you'll get 841. Notice that 400 plus 441 is 841, and we're left with the equation 841 equals 841. That's true, and therefore it confirms that we actually did this question correctly. Now, at one point as we were solving this, I needed to figure out how to factor 420 into 21 times 20. And I said to you, ah, I, you might not have ever seen that. What would you do? Let me just reiterate. If you don't see the factoring, then try something like that quadratic formula. It's very, very helpful to have different techniques and different ways to attack the same mathematical problem. That's something I want you to get very comfortable with as you're studying mathematics. If you don't try one approach, you don't like one approach, try a different approach. It's a very, very helpful way to solve mathematical problems. Now, let me say one other thing about this example, and that is you might be thinking, well, he could have given us the same example and just changed the hypotenuse length from 29 to 30 or 31 or any number, and everything would have worked out just fine. In fact, 29 is a pretty special number. I chose it really, really carefully because I knew that things would work out. It, if I would have given you a different number other than 29, let's say the number 17, and I would have asked you for two legs that were only one apart so that the hypotenuse length is 17, you'd actually find that you would never be able to find whole numbers or integers which would have worked in that case. So if you replace the hypotenuse length by 17, you could not find legs which were exactly one unit apart from one another so that you would build that right triangle. Well, in today's lesson, we've talked about this Pythagorean theorem, which is a really great example of a quadratic equation. I've talked about different ways that the Pythagorean theorem can be used in solving a lot of different problems with right triangles. And I would encourage you to watch for other ways that you might use the Pythagorean theorem in your future mathematical studies. Now, we've talked quite a bit about polynomials of degree one. Those were our linear equations or linear polynomials. And we've talked a lot about polynomials where the highest power was two. They had degree two. Those are called quadratic polynomials. Next time, I want us to shift gears a bit and talk about polynomials of even higher degree and talk about many of their features. I'll see you then. In many of the earlier lessons you and I have looked at in this course, we've been studying polynomials. When we were studying linear equations and their graphs, we were studying polynomials. And when we were studying quadratic equations and their graphs, we were also studying polynomials. Now, I've avoided using that word very often, but what I'd like to do today is to talk more about what a polynomial is and what we know about the family of polynomials and polynomial functions in general. So 
We should start by explaining what a polynomial really is. And in the process, I want us to also understand what a polynomial is not. It's just as important that we see what isn't a polynomial in order to understand what is a polynomial. So let's start with a working definition of a polynomial and use it in some examples. So it's gonna sound a bit technical, but bear with me. We'll, we'll try to tease it out a little in just a few moments. A polynomial in the variable x is an expression of the form a sub zero plus a sub one times x plus a sub two times x squared plus dot, 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 plus a sub n times x to the n. I know that sounds technical, but let's understand what it means. Each of the numbers a sub zero, a sub one, a sub two up to a sub n are simply that, they're numbers. They might be positive, they might be negative, they might even be zero. Those are going to be called coefficients. And all of the powers on x have to be positive integers. That's actually the most important part of this definition, that each of the powers on the x's must be positive whole numbers. Now, the other, only other comment I wanna make about that definition is the little dot, dot, dot that's right in the middle. What is that signifying? Well, we didn't write down every one of the terms. There might have been 100 different terms to write down in that sum that I showed you a moment ago. So in order to collapse the notation or to try to squeeze it some, I've put that dot, dot, dot in to show that there might have been other terms in the middle that we simply have not written down explicitly. So that's just there almost like a shorthand or a contraction to try to squeeze in the notation just a little bit. Now, you might think that everything I've just said is extremely confusing. In fact, your eyes might even be glazing over at this point, but don't do that. Let me show you some examples. You know, I've taught math for a long time, and I find that sometimes a few examples can help make the definition make a lot better sense. So let's just look at some examples and see some polynomials in action. First of all, five minus 27x is a polynomial. Five is a number, minus 27 is a number. Notice that the only power of x you really have here is x to the one that's inside the 27x. And of course, one is a positive integer. So that power on x is perfectly fine for this to be a polynomial. Five minus 27x is a polynomial. And notice something, it's actually linear. We would have seen that during our linear equation lessons a long time ago. Here's a second example. Four plus seven x minus three x to the second power. That is also a polynomial. Four is a number, seven's a number, negative three is a number. And notice the powers on x are x to the one and x to the two. And one and two are both positive integers. So four plus seven x minus three x squared is also a polynomial. And it's a quadratic polynomial because the highest power is two. The highest power on x is that two. Well, you would have seen quadratics for several lessons in this course already as well. So you see, for many, many lessons, you were studying polynomials. It's just that we were studying very special ones, linear and quadratic. Here's another example of a polynomial. Negative three minus 10x plus 10x squared plus 100x to the fifth. Now, before I go anywhere, let me make a, several comments about the polynomial I just showed you. Uh, first of all, some of you may have already seen these kinds of functions, and you might be saying, hey, I thought I was supposed to write polynomials with the largest power of x first, and then write all the smaller powers later on. So, for example, we might write 4 plus 7x minus 3x squared as negative 3x squared, plus seven x plus four, where the powers on the x actually go down. I wanna point out that those two things are the same polynomial. It's just that in one case, we've written the powers going in one direction, and in another case, we've written the powers of x going down. In fact, either of those ways of writing it is perfectly fine, but for the most part, we'll probably write our polynomials so that the powers actually do go down, starting with the highest power on x and then writing them um, from there in lower powers. Why would we care about which order to write things in? Well, in theory, it doesn't matter. 
But it turns out that the highest power on x is extremely important when it comes to polynomials. In a few minutes, I'm going to tell you why. And because of that, I'm going to go ahead and write my polynomials most of the time with the powers on x starting at the largest one and then going down from there. Now, I want you to also notice that it was okay to have positive and negative coefficients. Remember, coefficients are the numbers in front of the powers of x. The, po the sign of those coefficients doesn't matter. So I had a negative 10 as a coefficient, and I could have a plus 100 as a coefficient. Those are perfectly fine in polynomials. So don't worry about the signs of the coefficients so much. Also, you may have noticed that in the example I gave you, negative 3 minus 10x plus 10x squared plus 100x to the fifth, it looks like I actually missed some terms. I don't see an x cubed in there. I don't see an x to the fourth as well. And so you might be saying, wait a minute, he must have made a mistake. Is that a typo? The answer is no. You just want to think of those terms as actually having coefficients of zero. If you wrote in zero x cubed, it wouldn't change the polynomial, but because of that coefficient of zero, I don't really need to write in that term. So it's okay if you don't see some of the powers of x in the middle because you can just think of them as having a coefficient of zero. Now, let me make one more kind of radical comment about polynomials, and that is that the coefficients in front of the terms can be any real numbers that you want. So for example, square root of 3 times x to the fifth minus 1 fourth x to the fourth plus 19x is also a perfectly good polynomial. The key is not so much what the coefficients are. The key is that the exponents on the powers of x need to be positive integers. So I want to see things like x to the 1, x to the 2, x to the 3, x to the 20, and so on. I'm not as worried about where the coefficients come from. Now, I want you to notice that I said the phrase in the variable x when I gave my official definition of the word polynomial. But there's nothing special about x. We could use a different variable if we wanted, like a y or z or t or anything else. So for example, y cubed plus 8y squared plus 2y minus 17, that's a polynomial. It's just in the variable y at that point. And t to the fifth plus t to the fourth plus t plus one is also a polynomial, but in that case, we've used the variable t instead of the variable x. Okay, now some of you might be saying, well, it looks like just about anything could be a polynomial. And if you think that, well, you might think that because I've shown you so many examples, but you'd be wrong if you thought that just about any algebraic expression can be a polynomial. So what I'd like to do now is show you some examples of algebraic expressions which are not polynomials to help you start to see the contrast between what is a polynomial and what isn't. So here's an example of something that is not a polynomial. x to the one-third plus x plus two. Now, given the comments I made over the last few minutes, can you tell why that's not a polynomial? Well, it's not the two and it's not the x in the middle. It's the x to the one-third. That one-third is not a positive integer. Now, it is positive, but it's not an integer. One-third is a fraction. And because of that, I'm not allowed to have one-third as an exponent on one of the x's. It's not allowed to be a power of x if I want a polynomial. So x to the one-third plus x plus two cannot be a polynomial. It is not a polynomial. And in the same sort of way, the function square root of x is also not a polynomial because square root of x equals x to the one-half, and one-half is not a positive integer. One-half is a fraction. So square root of x, although it's a perfectly good function, is not a polynomial. That's the key. Now, let's look at some other things that are not polynomials, just to give you a feeling for some of the things that can't be polynomials. How about x to the negative two minus three times x to the negative one? Well, what keeps that from being a polynomial? It's not the minus three. I'm allowed to have negative coefficients in front of powers of x. 
So that the minus three is not keeping that from being a polynomial. What is keeping that from being a polynomial is the negative exponents on x, the negative powers, like the negative two and the negative one. Those negative powers keep x to the minus two minus three x to the negative one from being a polynomial. So when I'm talking about polynomials in this lesson today, I'm not imagining things like x to the negative two or x to the negative one. That would not be allowed. All right, let's try another example of something that's not a polynomial. What if you take x squared plus two x and divide it by x cubed plus one? Now, I need to point out x squared plus two x by itself is a polynomial and x cubed plus one by itself is a polynomial. But as soon as you take the ratio of those two things, x squared plus two x divided by x cubed plus one, that quantity, that ratio is no longer a polynomial. You will not be able to write that as a sum of terms where you just have x's raised to positive integer values. And therefore, x squared plus 2x divided by x cubed plus 1 is not a polynomial. I, I will point out that there are a few times, very rare cases, where you can divide one polynomial by another to get a polynomial back. But those are extremely rare, and in the case that I showed you, the specific example I've shown you, that is definitely not going to be a polynomial. So, once you start to think about the definition and these examples of things that are polynomials and things that are not polynomials, I hope you'll see that a polynomial is actually a pretty particular thing. Not every algebraic expression you write down gets to be a polynomial. Now, before we go forward, I want to mention two other vocabulary terms that are closely related to polynomials that are extremely important. So let's get those here. First, the degree of a polynomial is the largest power in the polynomial. So for example, the degree of 14x to the fifth plus 23x to the fourth minus 102x plus 19 is five. The degree of that polynomial is five. Notice that you have to be careful when you're looking for the degree. For example, what if I wrote this polynomial? 1 plus 3x plus 4x squared minus 8x cubed. The degree of that polynomial is 3. I have to go look in that thing for the highest power of x. And if I look carefully, I'm going to see the 3 on the negative 8x cubed. And so the degree of that is 3. Similarly, if I wrote down 2 minus 10x plus 8x to the fourth minus 5x squared, the degree of that polynomial is actually 4 because the highest power on any of the x's there is a four. Remember that the order that I write down the terms in the polynomial is not what matters. If I wanna find the degree, I've gotta be very careful and look for the largest power on the x. Hopefully, it's the polynomial's been written in such a way that that largest power is in front. Remember, I talked earlier about putting the largest power in front and then writing all the other powers later. If I wrote it that way, then the degree is easy to find. But if it hasn't been written that way, if the terms have been sort of jumbled up a bit, then I have to go find the degree very carefully by looking for that largest power of x somewhere inside the expression. Now, there's a second vocabulary term that's really common when we're studying polynomials, and that's called the leading coefficient. So what is the leading coefficient? Well, it's the coefficient or number in front of the term which contains the largest power of x. So for example, if I gave you the polynomial 14x to the fifth plus 23x to the fourth minus 102x plus 19, the leading coefficient is the number in front of the highest power of x. The highest power of x is the x to the fifth, so the leading coefficient in that polynomial is 14. The leading coefficient of one plus three x plus four x squared minus eight x cubed would be the negative eight that's in front of the x cubed. And the leading coefficient of two minus 10 x plus eight x to the fourth minus five x squared would be plus eight because that eight is sitting in front of the highest power of x, which is the x to the fourth. So you can see that the degree and the leading coefficient are somewhat linked because they all, they both sit 
in the same term. And if you actually write your polynomials with that highest power of x in front and then all the other powers later on, you'll see that the degree is very easy to find. It's the power on that x. And the leading coefficient is in front of all of the other terms. And that's one reason some people call it the leading coefficient. Sort of leads the polynomial if you've written your terms in, so, in that way. Now, I'd like to shift gears a bit and talk about the aspects of the graphs of polynomials that we can talk about. So, I'm not going to try to look at too many specific examples as I talk about their graphs, but I want to talk in general terms about the graphs of polynomials. One thing we can say is that the graph of a polynomial never breaks and it never has a sharp corner. I want to repeat that because it's very important. The graph of a polynomial never has any breaks in it and it never has any sharp corners. So, for example, I want to show you a few graphs of polynomials. I'm not trying to show you these in all their exact detail necessarily, but I would like you to at least get the general feel for what these graphs look like. So let's start out with the graph of x cubed minus 3x squared plus 2x plus 1. Again, I don't want you to worry about actually drawing it yourself. I just want you to get a feeling for what the graph looks like. And I want you to notice that it's a nice smooth curve. It's got a little bit of up and down to it, but notice that it does not break. There are not pieces broken apart in it, and you also don't have any sharp corners. Nice smooth edges as you look at the graph. Let's look at another example of a polynomial graph. Let's take x to the fourth minus 5x squared plus 2x. And again, I want you to notice the graph comes down, it makes some nice smooth curves, and it goes back up. No breaks in the pieces and no sharp corners either anywhere on the graph. Now, let's take another one. This one might look a little strange as a polynomial, but I wanted you to get uh, the feeling for a polynomial that might have a lot of uh, ups and downs to it. So here's the polynomial. 1 over 200 times x to the sixth minus 29 over 200 x to the fourth minus 3 25ths x cubed plus 43 over 50 x squared plus 6 fifths x. It's a lot to say. But the graph actually has a lot of very nice features. Again, you see the graph comes down. It's going to make a lot of different ups and downs, hills and valleys, so to speak, and then it takes off again. But I, I want you to see that you don't have any breakage in the graph and you don't have any sharp corners in the graph. Everything is nice and smooth. Now, why do I mention these breaks or sharp corners? Because if you look at the graphs of functions that are not polynomials, you will start to see things like breaks or sharp corners. In the case of sharp corners, let me mention the function x raised to the two-thirds power. Let me point out again, x raised to the two-thirds power is not a polynomial because two-thirds is not a whole number. And if you look at the graph of x to the two-thirds, you'll see that it looks a bit like a nice curve on one side and a nice curve on the other, but when they meet at the origin, you actually do get a sharp corner. And that sharp corner immediately tells you that you're not dealing with a polynomial. So there's an example of a perfectly good function, but its graph has got that sharp corner, and that reminds us that x to the 2 thirds is not a polynomial. Okay, let's look at another graph. And again, I'm not trying to get us today to see how to draw these graphs. I just want you to get a feel, visual feel, for what's happening with these graphs. Let's look at this function, x squared plus 1 over x squared minus 1. Remember a few moments ago I said when you take the ratio of two polynomials, like you do here, x squared plus 1 divided by x squared minus 1, you often do not get a polynomial in return. That ratio is not itself, as one thing, a polynomial. Well, let's look at its graph. And when you do look at the graph, you actually see that it's broken into three different pieces. There's a piece in quadrant one, there's a piece in quadrant two, and then there's a upside down sort of U shape that is right around the Y axis below the X axis. The fact that the graph is broken into those pieces like that tells us that we're looking at the graph of something which is not a polynomial. So it's very important that we see that polynomials have these Nice smooth curves, no sharp corners, no broken pieces, 
but that the graphs of many, many other types of functions do have either sharp corners or broken pieces. Now, next I'd like to talk about the domain of a polynomial for just a moment. Remember, the domain of a function is the set of things we're allowed to plug into the function, or the set of allowable input values for the function. It turns out that every real number is in the domain of a polynomial. You're allowed to plug in any real number you want into a polynomial. That's not true of other kinds of functions. For example, you can't plug x equals negative 2 into the function y equals the square root of x. Why? Because the square root of a negative number, like the square root of negative 2, doesn't make any sense. So x equals negative 2 is not in the domain of the function y equals square root of x. Similarly, you can't plug the value x equal 1 into the function y equals x squared plus 4 over x squared minus 1. Why? Because if you try plugging in 1 into that function, the denominator is going to become 0. 1 squared minus 1 is 1 minus 1, which is 0. And of course, you can't divide by 0. And therefore, x equals 1 is not in the domain of the function y equals x squared plus 4 divided by x squared minus 1. But in a polynomial, no matter what the polynomial is, it doesn't matter what you try to plug in. You're not going to end up with things like division by 0. You're not going to end up with negative numbers under radical symbols. And so the domain of a polynomial is the set of all real numbers. We can actually plug in any value that we want into the variables in a polynomial. And from a graphing perspective then, it means that there aren't any gaps in the graph. There aren't any places on the x-axis where the graph just sort of disappears or breaks apart. So what else can we say about graphs of polynomials? I think this is a really good set of topics to talk about before we close out our lesson. What about the number of x-intercepts of a polynomial? We talked about how many x-intercepts you could have with linear graphs and with parabolas, which were the graphs of degree 2 polynomials, or quadratic polynomials. What about if you have a polynomial with a much bigger degree? Well, here's the fact that we can quote. The number of x-intercepts of the graph of a polynomial is at most the degree of the polynomial. The number of x-intercepts doesn't have to equal the degree, it just has to be less than or equal to the degree. So for example, if I took a bunch of graphs with degree 4, I could then have either no x-intercepts, 1x-intercept, 2x-intercepts, 3x-intercepts, or 4x-intercepts. I could not have, for example, 5x-intercepts if the polynomial I start with only has degree 4. For example, if you look at the graph of x to the fourth plus 2, you'll see that the whole graph stays above the x-axis. So the graph of x to the fourth plus 2 has no x-intercepts. By the way, I need to make a quick comment here. x to the fourth plus 2, when you graph it, looks like a parabola. It's got that same u sort of shape. It turns out, in very technical terms, that it's not a parabola. I know it looks like one, but the ends actually go in a slightly different direction if you're looking at x to the fourth plus 2 compared to something like x squared plus 2. Oh, I know they all go up. In both cases, the ends go up. But in one case, the ends are going to be somewhat flatter as they go up, and in the other case, they'll be sharper. So the graph of x to the fourth plus 2 is not officially a parabola. Now, what if you looked at the graph of x to the fourth? That's also a degree 4 polynomial. And if you look at that graph, you'll see that it actually just sits right on the x-axis and therefore only has exactly one x-intercept. So we've seen an example of a degree 4 polynomial that has no x-intercepts and an example with exactly one x-intercept. If you plot x to the fourth minus 2x squared plus 1, you'll have exactly two x-intercepts. If you plot 2x to the fourth minus 4x squared, you'll actually have exactly three x-intercepts, and you get a sort of soft W shape in order to do that. 
And if you plot the graph of 2x to the fourth minus 4x squared plus 1, you'll have exactly four x-intercepts. So you really can have 0 or 1 or 2 or 3 or 4 x-intercepts if you have degree 4 polynomials. But what you can't have is 5 or more x-intercepts if you're plotting a degree 4 polynomial. And actually, we can say a little bit more about the graphs of polynomials besides just the number of x-intercepts they have. The comment can also be made that the ends of the graph of a polynomial never flatten out. They never just sort of get uh, horizontal, if you will, or close to horizontal. The ends of the graph of a polynomial will eventually either go up to plus infinity or go down to negative infinity. Also, we can actually say what happens to the ends if we look at the degree of the polynomial. If the degree of the polynomial is even, like in the case of a quadratic polynomial where the degree is exactly 2, then both ends either go up together or they both go down. Remember in, para in the parabola case, the ends go up or they both go down. If you look at all of the examples we looked at a moment ago of degree 4 polynomials, you'll notice that both ends eventually went up or both ends eventually went down. Now, I don't know what's happening in the middle, by the way. When I say that the ends go up, it might be the case that both ends go up, but in the middle, the polynomial's graph makes a bunch of ups and downs, a bunch of hills and valleys. I'm not talking about what's happening in the middle. I'm talking about what's happening on the ends. Now, if the degree is odd, what happens to the graph of the polynomial then? Well, if the degree of the polynomial is odd, then it turns out that one of the ends goes up and the other end will go down. Now, it might be in the other direction, but ultimately, one end goes up and the other end goes down. If the sign of the leading coefficient, remember what the leading coefficient is, it's the number in front of the term of highest power on x. If the sign of that leading coefficient is positive, then it turns out that the end on the left will be going down and the end on the right will be going up, something like this. If the sign of that leading coefficient is negative, then I know that the graph will actually change in its orientation. The left-hand end will be going up to plus infinity, and the right-hand end will be going down to negative infinity. So when my degree is odd for a polynomial, it means that the ends go in different directions. One goes to plus infinity, one goes to minus infinity. Now again, that's just the ends. I can't really say a whole lot about what's happening in the middle of the graph of a polynomial, but I can say definitely what happens in the ends as I look at the graphs. Now, I really should ask the question, what is it that is true about the leading coefficient that makes the ends behave in that way? And what I wanna to say today is this. If you're looking at a polynomial and you wanna know which term is the one that controls the others or is dominant, it turns out that it's the term that has the highest power on x. And that's because if you plug in a really, really large number for x, and I don't mean like x equals 100, I mean x equals 100 million, then you'll find that the term with the highest power on x is actually going to give you the biggest contribution to the polynomial. When you plug in large values of x and you think about the graph, it means that you're plugging in large values of x either on the positive side or large values of x on the negative side. And so the point is that what happens out on the ends is going to be affected the most by the term where the power on x is highest. If you think about it, 100 million to the fifth is much bigger than say 100 million squared. Now you might have been happy with either 100 million to the fifth dollars or 100 million squared dollars. But I promise 100 million to the fifth is much, much bigger than 100 million squared. Well, we've talked enough about end behavior. We talked about x-intercepts and so on with the graphs. In fact, we've spent time today talking about a lot of properties of polynomials. 
and we remembered that. We used to talk about linear polynomials. We may not have called them polynomials, but that's what we were talking about. And quadratic expressions, which were quadratic polynomials. We've learned a lot of other vocabulary terms today, like degree and leading coefficient. And I tried to help us see or visualize different parts of the graphs of polynomials, especially what's going on with the ends. Next time, we're going to talk about the algebra side of polynomials. We'll learn how to add, subtract, multiply, and even divide polynomials. And that's a very important part of our study of polynomials. So I look forward to talking with you then. In our last lesson, we discussed polynomials in very general terms. I would now like to spend a good bit of time in this lesson talking about the algebra side of polynomials, how we add, subtract, multiply, and divide polynomials. In the process, we're going to look at several examples of how to complete these operations on these polynomials, and we'll see that much of what we discussed in the lessons on linear and quadratic expressions can be done with these larger polynomial expressions. So let's take these operations one at a time and start with adding polynomials. You've already seen everything you need to know about how to add two polynomials. Basically, you just need to combine like terms. So with that rule in mind, let's look at the following example. I'd like us to simplify 7x to the fourth plus 5x squared minus 2x plus 3, that's one polynomial, plus the other polynomial, 8x to the fourth minus 9x cubed plus 15x squared plus 12x plus 27. The key here is that we must look for like terms. And what are the like terms in this case? They are the terms where the powers on x are the same. So we just need to be careful to combine those right terms together. And again, the like terms will be the ones where the powers are the same. So I see a 7x to the fourth, and then I see an 8x to the fourth in the other polynomial. I can combine those two by adding them, and I'll have 7 plus 8 equals 15, so that'll give me 15x to the fourth. The negative 9x cubed actually doesn't have another term with which to combine. But that's not a problem. Just leave it there by itself and move on to some of the other terms. 5x squared plus the 15x squared will give me 20x squared. Then I see a negative 2x, and it has 12x with which it can be combined. And negative 2x plus 12x is plus 10x. And lastly, I see a constant 3, and I see another constant, 27. And those two can be added together. 3 plus 27 is 30. When I take all of those pieces and glue them back together, my final answer is going to be 15x to the fourth minus 9x cubed plus 20x squared plus 10x plus 30. And that's the sum. Notice that almost all the terms actually had another term with which to be combined. The negative 9x cubed did not but it just came along for the ride, so to speak. And at the end, it showed up as a negative 9x cubed as part of the final solution. No problem at all. So that example was pretty straightforward. Let's try another one very quickly. Let's simplify 5x to the fourth plus 18x squared minus 10 plus 6x cubed plus 7x squared plus 8x. Again, I'm adding these two polynomials together, and all I really have to do is combine like terms. And when I do that, I see, again, that some of the terms have pieces that they can combine with, and other terms really don't. But when I combine the like terms that have the same powers on the x's, I should get, as a final answer, 5x to the fourth plus 6x cubed plus 25x squared plus 8x minus 10. Now, with those two examples done, let's answer the following question, which is kind of interesting to talk about when it comes to the degree of the polynomials. How does the degree of the sum of two polynomials relate to the degrees of the two polynomials that you started with? In other words, 
If you look at the degrees of the two separate polynomials that you added together, and then you look at the degree of the final answer, how do they relate? And the answer is that the degree of the sum is always going to be the larger of the two starting degrees. So the degree of polynomials actually doesn't get any bigger when you add two polynomials together. In the first example we did, the two polynomials we started with both had degree four, and the final answer that we got also had degree four. In the second example, one of the polynomials had degree four, and the other one had degree three. When we added them together, the final sum, the final answer, simply had degree four as well. Now, addition then is pretty straightforward. What about subtraction? Well, with subtraction, you still need to keep in mind this idea of combining like terms, just like you did with addition, but there's one more little thing you've got to watch for, and that is you must keep an eye on distributing the minus sign that comes in from the subtraction. This is a dangerous pitfall, so it's something you really have to watch for, and what I'd like to do is complete a couple examples for you just so we can watch for the distribution of that minus sign. So let's do the following example. Simplify 17x to the fourth plus 5x squared minus 2x plus 3 minus the polynomial 8x to the fourth minus 9x cubed plus 15x squared plus 12x plus 27. So we have a couple of polynomials there, kind of long polynomials. One is being subtracted from the other. We have to be careful to distribute that minus sign correctly. So my suggestion is going to be that we just first distribute that minus sign completely. And once we have that done, we can then combine the like terms. If you distribute that minus sign, you're going to have the following. 17x to the fourth plus 5x squared minus 2x plus 3 minus 8x to the fourth plus 9x cubed minus 15x squared minus 12x minus 27. Basically, all of the signs inside that second polynomial get switched either from plus to minus or minus to plus. Now, once you've written the problem in this new way, there's no doubt about what the sign of each term is. So all you need to do now is combine the like terms and we're done. So we start looking for common powers of x again. And I see a couple of powers that are of the form x to the fourth. There's a 17x to the fourth minus an 8x to the fourth. When I combine those two together, since 17 minus 8 equals 9, I know that 17x to the fourth minus 8x to the fourth equals 9x to the fourth. So that's fine. 9x cubed doesn't have another x cubed to combine with, so the 9x cubed just sits by itself. 5x squared minus 15x squared is going to be negative 10x squared. 5 minus 15 is negative 10. So that combination is going to give me negative 10x squared. Negative 2x minus another 12x is negative 14x, so that's fine. And 3 minus 27 is negative 24. You know, when you're doing these problems and you have all of those terms laid out on a piece of paper, I sometimes like to actually take a pencil as I'm looking for the like terms, and once I spot those like terms, circle them or cross them out or something, just so I can see that I've actually used all the terms. If that would help you, I would encourage you to do it as well. Once you've combined all those like terms together, your final answer is going to be 9x to the fourth plus 9x cubed minus 10x squared minus 14x minus 24. And there you go you've subtracted one polynomial from the other. Now, notice in the example we just finished that the degree of the result is not any larger than the degrees of the polynomials that we started with. So just like with addition, when you subtract two polynomials, the degree doesn't change. In fact, the degree of what you end up with is simply going to be the degree of one of the polynomials you started with, the larger degree, in fact of the two degrees that you started with. Now, I'd like to do one more subtraction qu pretty quickly because this distribution of that minus sign can really cause fits for some folks. So let's do one more example together of subtracting one polynomial from the other. Let's look at x cubed plus x squared plus one minus the polynomial negative five x squared plus seven x. Now, 
I'm going to tell you again, I think the first thing to do is to distribute that minus sign from the subtraction. And when you do that, you're going to get x cubed plus x squared plus 1 minus the negative 5x squared minus 7x. And of course, the minus negative 5x squared is the same as plus 5x squared. So what you really have is x cubed plus x squared plus 1 plus 5x squared minus 7x. Now, if you're looking for like terms there, there's actually only a couple. The x squared and the 5x squared can be combined together to give you plus 6x squared, and then everything else just comes along. So that your final answer is simply x cubed plus 6x squared minus 7x plus 1. Okay, we've talked about addition and subtraction. They're pretty straightforward. You combine the like terms, and with subtraction, you've got to watch for that minus sign being distributed. What I'd like to do now is move on to multiplying polynomials. Now, I'd like to start with an example where all we do is multiply one longer polynomial by a monomial. In other words, just one term being multiplied into the other polynomial. So here's the example I have in mind. Let's expand or multiply out 3x squared times the polynomial 6x cubed minus 4x squared plus 7. So I have a polynomial inside the parentheses, and then I have a little single-term polynomial, 3x squared, on the outside. And I want to multiply that out and get a new polynomial. Well, to be honest with you, this is just the distributive property. It's just a bit expanded given the size of the polynomial inside the parentheses. But the idea is I simply need to distribute that term on the outside into all of the other terms on the inside of the parentheses. It's very doable as long as we just walk through the steps. And I want you to remember something. When you multiply two powers of x together, you simply add the exponents. So let's do this problem. First, let's distribute the 3x squared into the parentheses. And when I do that, I'm going to have 3x squared times the 6x cubed plus 3x squared times the negative 4x squared plus 3x squared times the 7. And what I've done is just paired off 3x squared with each and every term that was inside the parentheses. And now I need to combine each of those little products. So let's start with 3x squared times 6x cubed. First of all, 3 times 6 is 18. And secondly, x squared times x cubed, when I multiply x squared with x cubed, I add the exponents. 2 plus 3 is 5. So that term is going to combine. The 3x squared and the 6x cubed will combine to give me 18x to the fifth. Similarly, 3x squared multiplied with the negative 4x squared is going to give me negative 12 times x to the fourth, because the exponent 2 added to the other exponent 2 gives me an exponent of 4. So that's going to give me negative 12x to the fourth. And lastly, 3x squared times 7 is simply 21x squared. So my final answer here when I multiply this one term into that other polynomial is 18x to the fifth minus 12x to the fourth plus 21 squared. 21x squared, and I'm done. Let me make a quick comment here before I move on to my next example, and I want to comment again about these degrees. Notice that the degree of the polynomial 18x to the fifth minus 12x to the fourth plus 21x squared is actually 5. The degree of that polynomial is 5, thanks to the x to the fifth term. That degree is not exactly the same as the degrees of the polynomials that I started with, is it? The degrees I started with were 2 from the 3x squared and 3 from the 6x cubed. Notice something special, though. The degree 5 that I ended up with from the 18x to the fifth term that degree 5 is exactly the sum of the two degrees that I started with. 2 plus 3 equals 5. So here's a very interesting fact about multiplying polynomials that's very, very different from adding and subtracting polynomials. When you multiply two polynomials together, the degree of the new polynomial is actually the sum of the degrees you started with. And that means the degrees actually get bigger. So multiplication is a way to build polynomials of big degree from polynomials with smaller degree. And that's a 
cool feature of multiplication with polynomials. You can actually keep building up and getting bigger and bigger degrees as you go. Now, I'd like to look at a second example involving multiplication of two polynomials. But this time, we're going to multiply a polynomial with two terms times a polynomial with three terms. And basically, this is just like FOIL that we saw in previous lessons, but it's a bit more involved because we have more terms inside. So here's the specific example I'd like to look at. Let's multiply out, or expand, x squared minus 7 times x cubed plus 9x squared minus 5x. So I want to now multiply this out and get one polynomial at the very end. The key here is that, just like when we were foiling two binomial expressions, we have to make sure that every term in the first polynomial, in the first set of parentheses, is multiplied with every term in the other set of parentheses. So, for example, the x squared has to be multiplied with each of the three terms inside the second set of parentheses, and the 7 must be multiplied with each of those three terms as well. So when we're all done doing all the multiplying out, we'll actually end up with six different multiplications that we have to perform. Once we've written all six of those out, we can then combine like terms. So here's what we would have. The x squared from the first set of parentheses would have to be multiplied with the x cubed. So I'll have x squared times x cubed, added to x squared multiplied with the 9x squared, and then I'll add to that x squared multiplied by the minus 5x. At that point, I've taken the x squared from the first set of parentheses and multiplied it with every term in the second set of parentheses. So that's done. Now I must multiply the 7 in the first set of parentheses with everything in the second polynomial. But don't lose the minus sign in front of the 7. And so from that 7, I'm going to have minus 7 times x cubed, minus 7 times 9x squared, minus 7 times negative 5x. And if you stare at what we have up to this point before we multiply it all out, you'll see that we actually have six different things now to do, starting with the x squared times x cubed and ending up with minus 7 times negative 5x. Six terms was exactly how many we were supposed to have as we did this multiplication. Now let's do the multiplication. You would have x squared times x cubed. That's x to the fifth because 2 plus 3 equals 5. So you have a term x to the fifth. The second term is going to be plus 9 x to the fourth because x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. Next, you'll have a minus 5x cubed and then a minus 7x cubed minus 63x squared plus 35x. You get a plus 35x at the end because of the minus 7 times the minus 5. Multiplication of two negatives gives you a positive. And now when you combine all those terms, you're going to have x to the fifth plus 9x to the fourth minus 12x cubed minus 63x squared plus 35x. And these kinds of problems deserve lots of practice when you start multiplying all these things out. So I'd like to move right to another example where we can see how to do this multiplication of two polynomials. Here's the example I want us to look at. Let's expand or multiply out x squared plus 2x plus 3 times x squared minus 4x minus 6. Again, each term in the first polynomial must be multiplied with each term in the second polynomial. That means I'm going to end up with nine different things to multiply together, three from the first with three from the second. So let's just jump right into it. You're going to have an x squared times an x squared plus x squared times negative 4x plus x squared times negative 6. Plus, now I need to multiply the 2x with everything. So I'm going to have plus 2x times x squared, plus 2x times negative 4x, plus 2x times negative 6. And then I'll end with plus 3x squared, plus 3 times negative 4x, plus 3 times negative 6. And when I combine all that together, I'm going to have x to the fourth, minus 4x cubed, minus 6x squared, plus 2x cubed, minus 8x squared, minus 12x, plus 3x squared, minus 12x, minus 18. There are nine different terms there, some of which are like terms with others inside that big conglomeration. 
And so now I need to very carefully put all of those terms together. And when I do so, looking for like terms, I'm going to end up with x to the fourth minus 2x cubed minus 11x squared minus 24x minus 18. Okay, I'd like to move on from here to some examples using division. So division of polynomials can actually be much more complicated than addition or subtraction or even multiplication can be. And it turns out that division of polynomials is very, very important as we move on to other types of functions. So what I'd like to do now is move forward to some division problems involving polynomials. Okay, so let's look at the following example. I'd like to simplify x squared plus 10x plus 21 divided by x plus 3. Now, what I'm going to do here is actually long division with these polynomials. So you may remember long division with numbers, with whole numbers. I'm actually going to do long division here with these polynomials. So here's how I'm going to begin. I'm going to start by drawing my division symbol. And inside that, I'm going to put the x squared plus 10x plus 21. On the outside of the division symbol, I'm going to write my x plus 3. And at this point now, I want to see how many times does x plus 3 go into x squared plus 10x plus 21. The key is to look at the x in x plus 3 and ask, how many times does that x go into x squared? Well, what is x squared divided by x? It's simply x. So in other words, x times x is x squared. I'm going to then write an x on top of the division symbol just because x times the x in the divisor equals x squared. And now I'm going to ask myself, if I had that x and I multiplied it with x plus 3, what would I get? And what I would get is x squared plus 3x. That's one of these multiplication problems that we just saw a moment ago. And I would write that x squared plus 3x directly under the x squared plus 10x. And now do you remember what you do at this point when you long divide numbers? You subtract. And so I would subtract the x squared plus 3x from x squared plus 10x. But at this point, I have to remember to subtract all of the x plus 3. So I have to do the distribution of that minus sign as I go. And when I do so, I'm going to have x squared minus x squared goes away. 10x minus the 3x will give me 7x. And now I have a 7x underneath my subtraction symbol, if you will. And I then have to do what? Well, I have to drop the next term. Remember when you did long division of numbers, you would drop the, drop the next digit. So I now drop down the plus 21, and I have 7x plus 21. I now ask myself a similar question. How many times will the x in the x plus 3 divide into the 7x from 7x plus 21? Well, x goes into 7x exactly 7 times, because 7 times x is 7x. I would go above my division symbol then and write plus 7. And now I have to ask myself, what does that 7 equal when I multiply it with x plus 3? So I'm going to take my 7 now and multiply it with x plus 3, and I'm going to have 7x plus 21. And I'm going to write the 7x plus 21 just below the 7x plus 21 that was already there. And now I subtract again. We're following the same pattern of long division that we've seen when we did long division of whole numbers as well. It's just a little more complicated because we have polynomials. But here's the key now. When you subtract, what are you left with? The answer is you're left with 0. And your remainder here is 0. And that means that you're done, of course. And your answer is x plus 7. When you divide x squared plus 10x plus 21 by the quantity x plus 3, you get x plus 7. Now here's a question for you. How would you check your answer? Well, do you remember how you checked long division problems that you used to do with whole numbers? You would multiply, and that's exactly what you do here as well, because multiplication is the opposite of division. And in this case, I would multiply the x plus 7 with the x plus 3. 
And I would hope that I get x squared plus 10x plus 21. But x plus 7 times x plus 3 is very straightforward to do with FOIL. You've already seen FOILing with those kinds of products. And in fact, if you FOIL that, you will exactly get x squared plus 10x plus 21. Now, that example was pretty clean. Uh, there was zero remainder. But zero remainders are not very typical. So I'd like to look at another example now where the remainder is a little messier. So here's the example. Let's find x cubed minus 6x squared plus 19x minus 4 divided by x minus 2. Okay, now this problem, again, sets up the way the earlier example set up. We draw our division symbol. We put the x cubed minus 6x squared plus 19x minus 4 underneath that division symbol. And we put the x minus 2 out in front. It acts like our divisor for this division problem. And now I ask myself, how many times does the x on that outside quantity divide into the x cubed? Or, to say it a different way, what would I have to multiply the x by in order to get x cubed? And the answer is, you would have to multiply it by x squared. So I write an x squared above my x cubed, and now I take that x squared and multiply it with the whole of x minus 2. And I'm going to get x cubed minus 2x squared. And that amount gets written right below the x cubed minus 6x squared. This is exactly how you did long division with whole numbers. It's just that we have all this polynomial stuff now floating around. But we can do it. Let's keep going. What do we do now? We subtract that x cubed minus 2x squared out of the x cubed minus 6x squared. And if you keep in mind that you have to distribute that minus sign when you do the subtraction, you'll see that the x cubed minus x cubed is 0, which is what you wanted. And you'll have negative 6x squared plus 2x squared from distributing that minus sign. And negative 6x squared plus 2x squared is negative 4x squared. And that goes in the next level. Now you have to drop the next term. You would have dropped a digit if you had been doing long division with just whole numbers. But now we drop the next term, which is plus 19x, so that we now have negative 4x squared plus 19x. And now we repeat the process. How many times will the x from the divisor divide into negative 4x squared? And the answer is exactly negative 4x times. And if I multiply x minus 2 times the negative 4x, I'll have negative 4x squared plus 8x. It's plus 8x because of the negative 4 times the negative 2. And so now I have the negative 4x squared plus 19x, and I must subtract from that negative 4x squared plus 8x. Again, I have to distribute that minus sign through but when I do that subtraction, I'll have minus 4x squared plus 4x squared, which is 0, and 19x minus 8x, which is 11x, positive 11x. And now what do I do? I drop the next term. And in this case, that's going to be a minus 4. And so I now have 11x minus 4. And I need to ask myself, how many times will the x from the x minus 2 divide into the 11x? Well, the answer there is pretty straightforward. It's exactly 11 times, because 11 times x is 11x. So I write a plus 11 above my division symbol, and now I say, what is plus 11 times x minus 2? Well, that's exactly 11x minus 22, and I now subtract that. Remember, we're just repeating the same steps as we walk through the problem. When we subtract the 11x minus 22 from 11x minus 4, the 11x's, of course, will cancel to give me 0 there, but I'll have minus 4 plus 22 because I have to subtract, and I'm then left with plus 18. But I don't have any more terms to drop down, and so it means that plus 18 is actually my remainder. And so the division is actually done. My final answer is x squared minus 4x plus 11 with a remainder of 18 in this case. So instead of having a remainder of 0, we actually have a remainder of 18. Not a problem. It does happen. And in fact, it happens quite often when you divide one polynomial by another polynomial. Well, today we've seen 
addition of polynomials and subtraction of polynomials, uh, multiplication and division of polynomials as well. We've seen how the FOIL operation that we saw before can actually be extended to multiplying larger polynomials together. And we've talked about how you can divide one polynomial by another, although that might be a bit messy at times uh, when you do so. But this discussion of division of two polynomials actually leads us to our next lesson, which is on something called rational expressions. So I'll see you then as we discuss these rational expressions.